Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, where each season, we pick six different movies that fall under one common theme. We give you some insight behind how, when, where, and why each movie was made. And on top of that, at no charge to you, our loyal listener, you get a full review of the movie from me, Bo Ransdell, and my co-host, Chad Cooper. We have made it to season six, and six rhymes with sex. So that's what we're doing this season, people. That's right. Turn out the lights, light some candles, put on some music, pour yourself that glass of wine. We're going all the way back to 2015 for a decidedly unsexy start to our sexy season. The film adaptation of Fifty Shades of Grey. The naughty movie that had all the ladies clutching their pearls is now a major motion picture And it is abysmal. Enough out of me. Let's set the mood. And here to do just that is my pal Chad. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fifty Shades of Grey. This is not a new story. We've seen it time and time again. Older man meets younger woman. There's an instant connection. And it leads to a complicated relationship. She enlightens him. He enlightens her. Youth meets maturity, innocence, and experience. And to highlight one example of this, we really should travel back in time to 1895, where Samuel L. Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, was introduced to a 14-year-old woman who was both deaf and blind. Their introduction took place at a dinner being held in honor of the young woman at the home of Lawrence Hutton, the literary editor of Harper's Magazine at the time. Hutton was a friend of Mark Twain, and the young woman being honored at the dinner was attending a school for the deaf in New York City. Twain was, at the time, 60 years old when he was introduced to the teenage guest of honor. Over the duration of the evening, the other guest at the dinner noted that the young woman seemed to be more at ease with Twain than any of the other party's attendees. The young woman would later write of the evening and her encounter with Mark Twain that he entered into my limited world with enthusiasm just as he might have explored Mars. Blindness was an adventure that kindled his curiosity. He treated me not as a freak, but as a handicapped woman seeking a way to circumvent extraordinary difficulties. The young woman had learned to understand a person's words by touching her fingertips to their lips as they spoke, which she did as Twain and she conversed. She said of his speech that he had a truly wonderful voice and wrote of the experience, To my touch, it was deep and resonant. He spoke so deliberately that I could get almost every word with my fingers on his lips. I can feel the twinkle of his eye and his handshake even while he utters his cynical wisdom in an incredibly droll voice. He makes you feel that his heart is a tender Iliad of human sympathy. A dinner party, a chance encounter, an undeniable connection. And so it was that a lifelong friendship began between Mark Twain and the young Helen Keller. A few years after their meeting, Twain became aware that Keller may have to end her education due to an inability to pay for her tuition. Twain used the power of the pen and wrote to the wife of Henry H. Rogers, an executive with Standard Oil, and Twain's most wealthy friend. In his letter, Twain requested that Mrs. Henry H. Rogers convince Mr. Henry H. Rogers to assist Keller with her tuition predicament, saying, It won't do for America to allow this marvelous child to retire from her studies because of poverty. And with that letter, Keller's education at Harvard's sister college, Radcliffe, was paid for, allowing her to become the first deaf and blind student to earn a bachelor's degree. Keller's eternal optimism counterbalanced the sardonic wit of her friend Mark Twain. And Twain felt Keller was one of the most important historical figures of all time, describing her as the most wondrous person of her sex that has existed on this earth since Joan of Arc. The two friends exchanged letters over the years, and in 1903, Twain wrote to his friend, addressing an accusation of plagiarism that was made against Keller. A short story that Keller had written titled The Frost King was accused of being curiously similar to Margaret Canby's Frost Fairies. 
Keller was ultimately acquitted of the plagiarism charges, but the accusation of wrongdoing left a mark on Keller that really lasted for years. In his letter to Keller, Twain shared his thoughts on the creative process and what he saw as the myth of originality. Twain wrote, Oh dear me, how unspeakably funny and owlishly idiotic and grotesque was that plagiarism farce, as if there was much of anything in human utterance, oral or written, except plagiarism. The kernel, the soul, let us go further and say the substance, the bulk, the actual and valuable material of all human utterances is plagiarism. For substantially all ideas are secondhand. And you know what? Mark Twain is right. Everyone who creates something unique is inspired by something someone else did or said. People inspire people through words and deeds. Therefore, rendering pure originality, as Mark Twain called it, a myth. A strong-willed woman, an independent man of means, a most unexpected relationship, and a story inspired by another writer's success? Mrs. Helen Keller, Mr. Mark Twain, may I please introduce you to Miss Anastasia Steele and Mr. Christian Gray. Fifty Shades of Grey was created from the most unlikely of places, the Twilight novels. You know, the whole saga of the misunderstood Bella who is mysteriously drawn to the handsome Edward and then eventually she learns that Edward is a member of a vampire family that doesn't drink human blood but instead they drink animal blood and Bella and Edward, while well, they fall in love while James, this other vampire from this other coven, he tried to kill Bella but Edward and the other Collins defended Bella and she gets away and goes to Phoenix where she's tricked into confronting James who tries to kill her but then Edward rescues her and that all happens just in the first book. You know what, let me start again. Stephanie Meyer is the author of the wildly successful Twilight novel series. Meyer released one Twilight novel each year from 2005 through 2008 for a total of four books. Once these books were set loose in the wild, eager fans took to the internet in the early to mid-2000s and they began to produce some highly questionable fanfiction, as if there is any other kind of fanfiction. One particular author, known as Snow Queen's Ice Dragon, published an episodic piece of some Twilight fanfiction featuring Bella and Edward having some crazy, insane, X-rated, hardcore vampire sex. Not that there's any other kind of sex for vampires to have. Some readers of Snow Queen's Ice Dragon's reimagination of Bella and Edward's physical relationship started posting their comments, voicing their opinions, on the graphic gettings of it on of these two literary icons. These comments led Snow Queen's Ice Dragon to remove these works from fanfiction sites and publish them on a separate site, 50shades.com, under the author's real pen name, E.L. James, short for the author's full name, Erica Leonard James. E.L. James was born in 1963 and was brought up in Buckinghamshire, England. After graduating from college, she took a job as a studio manager's assistant at the National Film and Television School in Beaconsville. She got married, had two sons, and was living a pretty normal life. That was until 2008 when E.L. James went to the movies to see Twilight. Let's just say that Twilight lit something inside of E.L. James, so much so that she became quite involved with the Twilight novel. She reportedly devoured all of the available Twilight novels multiple times over a few days, and then she decided to write her own book, a book that would be an original sequel to the Twilight novels. Starting in January of 2009, E.L. James wrote not one, but two novels by the end of summer of the same year, she was inspired by other fan fiction and began publishing her work as a novel on the increasingly popular e-readers, such as the Amazon Kindle and the now obsolete Nook e-reader, which was sold by the now obsolete Barnes & Noble bookstores. The popularity of Snow Queen's Ice Dragon Twilight fan fiction inspired E.L. James to rework her current pieces of fan fiction and present them with alternate protagonists. This new piece of fan fiction was called Master of the Universe. No, it's not that one. Different one. And it featured two new principal characters, a young female heroine, Anastasia Steele, and a rich, handsome, successful businessman, Christian Grey. This new series reworked some of E.L. James' existing material, and it underwent a transformation from one novel into a trilogy. The first installment was titled Fifty Shades of Grey and was released much like her previous work as an e-book in May of 2011. 
The second volume, Fifty Shades Darker, came out a few months later, and the final installment, Fifty Shades Free, appeared in January of 2012. And with limited marketing and a whole lot of middle-aged married women word of mouth, this series exploded in popularity, leading it to be classified as mommy porn by TV reporters that should be ashamed of themselves for calling it that. But it wasn't just moms digging the sexy goings-on of these books. Teenagers, college-age women, and I'm sure some senior citizens in assisted living facilities that could figure out how to make a Kindle turn on got a little hot under the polyester nightgown collar too. And it was the popularity of e-readers and the ease by which one could anonymously purchase the book that really helped to skyrocket its popularity. Originally, it wasn't even an option to pick up a physical copy in a store and shamefully take it up to the counter and lie about how you're buying it as a gag gift for a bridal shower for your friend Bethany, who just loves this kind of thing. You couldn't do that until Vintage Books picked it up and actually published it about a year after its initial digital release. And at this point, the pop culture popularity of Fifty Shades was undeniable. By August of 2012, Amazon UK announced that it had sold more copies of the Fifty Shades trilogy than it had the entire Harry Potter series combined, putting E.L. James ahead of J.K. Rowling as Britain's best-selling author. The popularity of the books also reportedly led to an increase in emergency assistant calls to help amateur bondage enthusiasts escape from handcuffs that proved to be more troublesome in the bedroom than initially expected. Fifty Shades? Anastasia? Christian? British people handcuffed to bedpost? This was truly a cultural phenomenon. And nobody was more surprised by the success of the Fifty Shades books than the author herself. E.L. James described the Fifty Shades trilogy as her midlife crisis. She said that she just took all of her fantasies and put them down on the page. A little over two years after the initial digital release of her first book, E.L. James topped the Forbes list of highest earning authors with a reported income of $95 million, which included $5 million for the film rights of Fifty Shades of Grey. The popularity of these novels and the sexual nature of the content was a match made in Hollywood heaven. Multiple studios were all itching to be the one to bring the erotic goodness to the silver screen, Sony, Paramount, Warner Brothers, all the usual suspects. But it was Universal Pictures and Focus Features that got the rights to make the films. During the negotiations, E.L. James held on to some creative control, including who would produce the movie. E.L. James selected Michael DeLuca and Dana Brunetti, fresh off of their success of delivering the Aaron Sorkin interpretation of how Facebook took over the world in the social network. Kelly Marcel, who wrote Saving Mr. Banks, the movie that featured Tom Hanks as legendary animator Walt Disney, and Emma Thompson as Mary Poppins author P.L. Travers. If you haven't seen that movie, it centers on a very successful businessman who is trying to convince a woman to legally agree to do something she initially is really reluctant to do, but in the end, she kind of gives in to his convincing point of view. Hmm, interesting. Next, the movie needed a director. Originally, they wanted Joe Wright, who had helmed Pride and Prejudice, but scheduling conflicts made him unavailable. Other directors were considered, including Patty Jenkins, who had directed Charlize Theron in Monster and would later go on to direct Wonder Woman. Bill Condon, who directed the first two Twilight movies, was considered. Steven Soderbergh, who'd had some early success in his career with Sex, Lies, and Videotape, he was in the running, as was Angelina Jolie. They took a look at Gus Van Sant, but ultimately the job went to English filmmaker and photographer Samantha Taylor Johnson. Taylor Johnson had numerous successful photo exhibits throughout her career, and in August of 2008, she was chosen to direct Nowhere Boy, the biographical film about the early life of John Lennon. Taylor Johnson said that she drew on other erotic films for inspiration, including Nine and a Half Weeks, The Last Tango in Paris, and Blue is the Warmest Color to really help guide the tone of the adaptation of Fifty Shades of Grey. Taylor Johnson completed the film and was the most obvious choice to return for the film's sequel, but Taylor Johnson walked away from the franchise due to creative differences with the book's author, E.L. James. Johnson later publicly said that she regretted directing the first film, but, you know, hey, we all got regrets, right? With a director in place, well, for the first movie anyway, and a writer adapting the novel to the screenplay, the movie needed its two leads, Anastasia and Christian. Originally, it was reported that Twilight star Robert Pattinson had been E.L. James's first choice for the role of Christian Grey. Well, duh. 
But ultimately, the idea of Pattison and his Twilight co-star Kristen Stewart in the film would have been, quote, weird, end quote. After some examination of various actors and actresses, it was announced by E.L. James herself on September 2nd, 2013, that Charlie Hunnam was cast as Christian Grey and Dakota Johnson would play Anastasia Steele. But then Hunnam dropped out unexpectedly because he was working on the FX biker gang drama series Sons of Anarchy, and he had also promised Guillermo del Toro that he would appear in his gothic romance feature Crimson Peak. And so the role of Christian Grey was recast, and the part was given to James Dornan. James Dornan is an actor slash model slash musician from Northern Ireland. Well, if that isn't the whole package. He's most recognizable to American audiences as Sheriff Graham Humpert on the ABC series Once Upon a Time, which features a lot of storybook characters getting to all sort of mischievous adult happenings. If you never saw the show, just think Shrek meets Melrose Place. Dakota Johnson was more well known as the daughter of actress Melanie Griffith and actor Don Johnson. Dakota Johnson had a career that involved modeling and some acting with bit parts in movies and TV here and there, but it was her casting as Anastasia Steele in Fifty Shades of Grey that really put her in the spotlight. Some fans of the book Fifty Shades of Grey were filled with passionate, seething hatred of the movie's casting choices. There were online petitions calling for film producers to change the casting, especially of Christian Grey. But ultimately, the movie makers ignored the cries of all these self-righteous, opinionated, crazy people and just made their own movie. Production began in December of 2013 and wrapped up a few months later in February of 2014, with the majority of the movie shot in the Gastown district of Vancouver, Canada. Halfway through production, and more than a year before the film's release, Universal displayed posters with a silhouette of the film's male lead accompanied by the phrase, Mr. Grey will see you now. A few weeks later, on Valentine's Day, the studio released the first photo of Dakota Johnson as Anastasia Steele, and four months later, an official image of Dornan as Christian Grey was released on the film's official Twitter account. Following the viral, grassroots success of the original book's marketing, the promotion of the movie relied heavily on the usage of social media and word of mouth, especially from high-profile influencers including Beyonce, who debuted a teaser for the trailer on her Instagram account five days before the trailer's official release. 200 days before the movie actually hit theaters, a full trailer featuring an updated version of Beyonce's song Crazy in Love was released. The trailer for the movie was viewed on YouTube over 36 million times in its first week of release. The trailer accumulated over 100 million views in its first week of release through different channels and websites, becoming the biggest trailer ever released in history. And by the time the movie was ready for its official release, the trailer was viewed over 193 million times on YouTube alone. Fifty Shades of Grey was released on February 13th, 2015, and the marketing team worked hard to let audiences know that it was okay to come see the movie in theaters. Opening it over Valentine's Day gave the movie a romantic edge. It was a couple's event, or a movie for girlfriends to go see together as a group outing. The source material led many to believe that the movie would receive an NC-17 rating, greatly impacting the film's audience reach, as some theater chains refused to distribute films with an NC-17 rating but the movie ended up with an R rating based on, quote, strong sexual content, including dialogue, some unusual behavior, and graphic nudity and language. I like the part about some unusual behavior. Anti-pornography watchdog group and founders of the No Fun Club, Morality and Media, argued that the film's R rating severely undermines the violent themes in the film and does not adequately inform parents and patrons of the film's content. They also felt that the MPAA was encouraging sexual violence by letting the film slide by without an NC-17 rating. But let's be honest, weren't nobody accidentally making their way into this movie without knowing what they were getting in for when those lights went down? But that didn't stop the protests and online petitions and threats to boycott movie theaters, and all this negative reaction to the movie did exactly what protesters wanted. It stopped the movie from being released. I'm kidding. Despite all of these efforts to stop the movie from coming out, somehow or another, it came just the same. And where did it come? Well, it came in the movie theaters. Fifty Shades of Grey opened as the number one movie in the United States, and it ultimately raked in $166 million domestically and a whopping $571 million worldwide against a budget of $40 million. At the end of its theatrical run, Fifty Shades of Grey was the fourth highest grossing R-rated film of all time, 
behind The Hangover Part 2, The Passion of the Christ, and The Matrix Reloaded. Hmm. All of these movies feature characters getting beaten, yet for very different reasons. Interesting. Not only did Fifty Shades of Grey clean up at the box office, the movie received high critical praise from fans and critics alike. I'm kidding again. The movie received pretty much nothing but negative reviews citing the acting, the screenplay, the pacing, pr pretty much everything about the movie was called out for being terrible. Some critics did say that the movie was better than the source material. Moira McDonald of the Seattle Times said in her review that, quote, Fifty Shades of Grey, the movie, for the record, is not quite as bad as Fifty Shades of Grey, the book. But that's not saying much. End quote. And there were inevitable comparisons of Fifty Shades of Grey and Nine and a Half Weeks and Secretary as they all focus, in one way or another, on a sadomasochistic affair. But these mostly came from cinema eggheads getting all high and mighty with their snooty movie opinions. What about all those fans of mommy porn? What did they think? Well, some liked it, some didn't. And that's how it goes with adaptations of novels to the silver screen. The screenwriters, the directors, the actors, they all work hard to deliver an accurate interpretation of the source material, and as often the case, they subjectively get some things right and some things wrong. It's impossible to capture a universal interpretation of literary icons that truly match the mental images that each reader has within their own imagination. And what about Fifty Shades of Grey? Is the movie more accurate than not to the literary source material? Was the casting aligned with the author's vision? What would Mark Twain and Helen Keller think about this movie if they had seen it? Or in her case, if she'd been able to see it, or even hear it for that matter? You know what? Let's get Bowen here and let's sort this whole thing out. Ladies and gentlemen, doms and subs. Oh boy, it's Fifty Shades of Grey. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, here with my super sexy co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you this evening? Oh, I'm we feeling always... sexy, Chad. Nothing nothing sexier <laughs> than this movie. We, we always say this evening. We tend to record these at night. You may be listening to this episode in the morning or the afternoon. So, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, just in case we don't see you later. I'm sticking to my guns. If you're listening to this on a treadmill at 10 a.m., turn this shit off. You wait until the sun goes down. You pour yourself a glass of Chardonnay and you relax because it's sexy time. In fact, in fact, let me, it's, I think there's fair warning to be given here because I know we've gotten a lot of feedback from people listening to the show saying uh, that they kind of use the show as a bit of a babysitter. You know, it's you plop the kids down in front of the radio mm -hmm. or, or a podcast player of your choice. Uh, you throw on some Swamp Thing. There's some funny voices. The kids laugh. Everybody has a good time. Not this season, no. parents. You, you, you put the kids to bed because things is getting sexy. And let me also say, for anyone who stumbled across this, this season's theme is you can do it. And it's not a motivational uh, season, unless your motivation is you're wanting to have sex with someone. And in that case, you can do it. Yeah, it's it. You were doing you know, it. A little hubba hubba. Let's go ahead and deal with the unpleasantries that will be the next 60 minutes to 48 hours of conversation. We cannot go as long as the runtime of this movie. <laughs> That's our goal, to be shorter than the film itself. So... <laughs> Right, a movie made up of 85% montages and music videos. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. Uh, clearly, we're talking about uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Our movie opens with an ominous dark sky that goes from partly cloudy to mostly cloudy with a chance of sexy. Fifty Shades of Grey clouds, man. This movie is fucking art <laughs> we then fade to black and we get 50 shades of gray which by the way 50 is spelled out and it's not 50 so they're they're not confused with the police one supposes yo 50 shades of gray <laughs> <laughs> everybody scatter we then cut to a wide shot of seattle which is even more dreary and bleak than it normally is and if you squint your eyes this movie almost looks like it's being shot in black and white <laughs> yeah 
it's a real snoozer of a color palette along with everything else in this movie like this is the movie they prescribe when patients don't respond to thorazine <laughs> a lot of this movie looks like they're overlaying a filter to make it look even more bleak than normal like you know how cheap horror films over on the sci-fi network they pull that trick where they want to make daytime look like nighttime and they put in that heavy blue filter to where it almost passes as very bright moonlight it's like it's like uh, that but if you had a filter for depression <laughs> yeah like if there were such a thing as a cure filter <laughs> Where it just played Fascination Street in its entirety <laughs> over a camera lens. I don't know. Maybe you just put that record in front of the lens. Maybe that's how you do it. That 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 could quite possibly work. We then get our first shot of Christian Grey, our main male character. I can't say hero or protagonist. He's just the guy. Um, he's sitting in <laughs> right. he's sitting in this closet that is the size of most apartments, and he's on this blue ottoman, and he's lacing up his Nike running shoes. And for a brief moment, I thought, is that Tom Holland? And I was like, no, that's not him. Because he doesn't have spider web shooting out of his arms. Oh, that'd be good. That would be good. Fifty Shades of Spider. <laughs> In this apartment-sized closet, we see that all of Christian Grey's clothes are black or gray suits. And he's got white shirts. He's overly meticulous. He's orderly to a fault. Subtlety is not this movie's strong suit. <laughs> no, nor is attention to detail. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> I do like a tie drawer, though. Like, I don't have enough ties to warrant a whole drawer full of them. I got a tie around here somewhere. I think it's holding my surfboard. <laughs> also, hey, and speaking of the tie thing, right about this time, guess what pops up on the screen? Music by Danny Elfman. I'm like, what the fuck? Not that you notice, but... I did not mention that in the opening. And there's good reason. Because if you didn't know Danny Elfman did this music, you wouldn't know Danny Elfman did this music. There's one scene in this film that feels a little Elfman-esque. But for the most part, you have no idea who did any of this scoring. I, I guess it's difficult... To use the, like traditional Danny Elfman score for a movie like this, where you know he's going down on Dakota Johnson, and it's just whip your ass, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, it's a little too Susian. We get to see Christian Grey as he's going out for his morning jog along the waterfront, and it almost looks like he gets attacked by seagulls, but he gets away. He's okay, and then we find out that this guy is a billionaire i do not think that billionaires go out for morning jogs on the city streets a hundred percent no if i was a billionaire i sure as hell wouldn't go out for a jog in the real world i would hire someone to grab my feet and make the running motion i wouldn't be so much worried about the health benefits i would be more concerned about being victim of a Sao Paulo snatch and grab. I don't want to end up with a sack over my shoulders and a blackjack cracked up beside my forehead. Yeah, you're going to get gone like the Lindbergh baby. You go out <laughs> on the streets like that, alone. Where the fuck is Taylor when you need him? He should be jogging right beside you with an Uzi. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Gray. Uh, vagrant. We come back to Christian's apartment. He's getting dressed and he's wearing the clothes that I assume are the same things that he wears every single day. You know, gray or black suit, white shirt, blah, blah. For a living, what does he do? Telecommunications? That's his job or business? He's in the business of business, Chad. <laughs> Is telecommunications the 21st century equivalent of being an advertising from the 80s and 90s? Or an architect? Yeah. Everybody <laughs> was either an architect or they were in advertising. You say that, nobody asks any questions. Because I, I, oh. I once worked for an advertising agency, or at least that's what I told my wife I did. She didn't ask any questions about that for four years. I just went to the bus station every day. <laughs> Watch people get on and off. <laughs> where do they go? Where do they come from? <laughs> Lunchtime, do... where's the trash can? <laughs> I hope someone threw out an egg salad sandwich today. During the opening, there's this montage of all this nonsense. And there's a cover of I Put a Spell on You, uh, which was originally recorded by Screaming Jay Hawkins. Which Do you know why they called him Screaming Jay Hawkins? Because he screamed? Well, he especially screamed when somebody was whipping his ass when he was having sex. Why use this sterile? And this is the whole problem with the, this movie. This sterile piano 
airy, I put a spell on you. Why not play the Screamin' Jay Hawkins? That that song makes me want to fuck. Because <laughs> it's just like blues guitar and somebody going, oh! and you're like, God, get in there. <laughs> and this is all, I put a spell on you. Oh, it's so terrible. When Christian is getting dressed and he puts on his gray suit, and then to your point earlier, it's like, Oh, his last name is Gray. Who dresses according to their colorful last name? I don't see Jack Black pulling that, or Vanna White, or Pink, Josh Blue, Red Fox, Yellow Beard. None of this is dignified behavior. And I know what you're thinking. Mr. Green Jeans did it, but guess what? That wasn't his real name. (laughs) Check in, mate. Well done. It's during this montage that we get to see just randomly interjected shots of Anastasia Steele. Holy shit. What is her name, Chad? Her name is Anastasia Steele. Certainly not. That has to be one of the dumbest names I've ever heard. (laughs) Wait a minute. You're telling me that Anastasia Steele and Christian Grey are two of the worst names in literature or film history? I argue that they may be two of the greatest names. You, You truly don't believe that they're up there with... Atticus Finch or Hester Pren or Fox Mulder. So you're saying that this is more akin to say Dr. Christmas Jones or Cole Trickle. I think <laughs> uh, less so Christian Grey. I'll give you that one stupid movie. If you want to do your dumb color analogy, I get it. <laughs> but Anastasia Steele, she might as well have been a Bond girl. You're absolutely right. It's <laughs> just the worst. And every time they say it in this movie, I have to take this movie a little less seriously. <laughs> We get to see Anastasia fumble bum her way over to her beat up piece of shit Volkswagen car. Uh, We then cut to a building that says gray house outside. (laughs) Yeah. And, and everybody walking around this skyscraper, they just look miserable as they are lumbering their way into work. It looks like a child's interpretation of what adults do all day long. Right, there's everything but like a crooked lightning bolt leading to the place with Dan Hedaya in the background saying, I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? To go along with that, this show of people shuffling into work is only bested by the employees of American Panoscope Corporation (laughs) heading in to make rectal probes. Hashtag (laughs) Joe versus the volcano. Hashtag Waponi Woo. Hashtag close the main drain. (laughs) <laughs> hashtag dear god whose name i do not know <laughs> this whole episode was worth it because of that <laughs> oh, i'm so proud of us um uh, so yeah so we get dakota johnson aka anastasia Steele, running through the college campus in the rain and her roommate is allowing her she gets home and her roommate kate is like hey uh how about you don't take your piece of shit car to this uh interview that you're doing on my behalf for some reason like here's another leap of logic of like i'm a reporter chad if i have an interview scheduled and i am so sick i can't attend i don't just give you some notes and be like hey all the research i've done on this guy don't worry about it just chat with him ask those questions and it'll all make sense Think about every roommate that you ever had, present company excluded. (laughs) (laughs) How many of your roommates would you trust to even go drop a letter in a mailbox for you, let alone go conduct a one-on-one interview with a billionaire? Yes, with one of the theoretically most powerful (laughs) men in the world. I was like, if my roommates were 80% accurate taking a piss, shit, it was a banner day if they took a shit and flushed the toilet. (laughs) (laughs) It is a ridiculous ask. And what's worse is she has apparently given this duty to someone who doesn't understand the basic foundation (laughs) of an interview where you know what question you're going to ask before you ask it. When roommate Kate asks Anastasia if she knows where she's going and how to get there, and then Anastasia says, yes, I have a GPS and a 4.0 GPA. What kind of 
arrogant, smug asshole are we dealing with here? Who has the right. audacity to toss around their gray point average like that? Fuck you. Don't take my car. I hope yours gets hit on the way. <laughs> In their apartment, there is this three by three grid of shelves that are filled with vinyl albums. And then there's a bike hanging on the wall. And I immediately thought, I hate these people. And I just met them because I immediately know that these assholes compost. I know that they drink craft beer. I know that they buy all of their clothes at thrift stores. I know that they're vegan. And worst of all, they pass off sarcasm as humor. Fuck the both of them. I, no, there is not a likable character to be had in this movie. <laughs> I, I searched high and low, Chad. I was hoping drunk dad, maybe he was going to come through for me or, you know, the lady from Miller's Crossing. None of them. No. It's all, all a bust. You're right. There is not one likable character in this whole movie. Anna shows up, uh, which is, is the name she goes by. That's her peasant name. It looks like apparently Christian Grey is in the business of hiring models to just mill around because everyone's beautiful and fashionable. And it's this crazy white space. It looks like the devil wears Prada. Yes. They're all fair haired Caucasian runway models and they're all wearing gray suits. And every, right. everything in this building is black and white and great shit. For a moment, I thought I was watching Pleasantville. <laughs> right. Before Joan Allen has sex. Yeah. <laughs> I do not like to think about Joan Allen having sex. Really? N no. You know what? We've discussed this. You have a type and we are very, very <laughs> different people, Bo. We are. I think we'll get to that here in, in this film. <laughs> Anna shows up and she she is dressed like if a librarian from Little House on the Prairie had stumbled <laughs> into this office. And and the model secretary leads her in uh to Christian Gray's office, you know, and it's the you know the the line from the the ads, Mr. Gray will see you now. And as soon as Anna walks in, she falls so that the first time Christian Gray sees her, she is on her knees. Yeah, see, I looked at this thinking, are we in a Billy Wilder romantic comedy? Oh, no, no, no. This movie has its theme, and I will give it at least that because it doesn't do anything else right. <laughs> so, um, she realizes that she hasn't brought a pen. Christian Gray gives her a pencil. And comes around the desk and hands her one, and he's he's you know, sort of hovering over her. Well, when he when she, when she comes in after she sits down, he's like, well, "I only got like ten minutes. I'm busy with my business and making money because I'm very powerful." I I think that that the, the problem with the performance of Christian Gray by Dornan is that, as I noted in the intro, he is not from these United States, and the show. Once Upon a Time, it was filmed, I believe, in Toronto. And this movie is filmed in Vancouver. And I truly believe that he just had an ear for, let's call it North American English, that was so infused with Canadian affects that you can't get away from that. Because the whole movie, he's just like, what are you doing over there? You don't even know. I am I'm in charge here. I'm Christian Grey. I like hovering over you. <laughs> Why not? Huh? Look, I know business all the way from A to Z. All right? So you pay attention. Celsius. Uh, uh, kilometers, eh? <laughs> when she picks up this pencil that he gives her, it has the word gray printed on it. What billionaire has their name printed on a pencil? The answer is none of them. You're not going to see Bill Gates handing out pre-sharpened number twos with the word Gates printed on them. I can think of one rich person that would plaster his name on anything he possibly could. <laughs> Pins, buildings, you name it, Chad. Stakes, water, yeah. casinos. <laughs> failed presidencies anastasia starts asking questions for this school newspaper give me a break and in her first question she says you're so wealthy and successful what do you and then this rude prick finishes her question he's like to what do i attribute all my success huh <laughs> As stated earlier i already don't like her character and at this moment i was like well i don't like him 
this is going to be a difficult one hour and 40 minutes. If only there were only an hour 40 left to go at this point. This is first 10, Chad. We got an hour 55 to go at this point. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I was given time served for the first 10. <laughs> Good behavior for not turning it off immediately and walking off this show. <laughs> There is a genuine lack of chemistry between these actors. <laughs> it's so great. That is uncomfortable. By the time he gets around to vlogging her and shit, I couldn't possibly be turned on by this because I'm starting to think about them as actors being uncomfortable in this scene, which is exactly what it looks like. Christian tells her, I've always been good with people and what motivates them. I'm good with art of the deal. I'm good at business. And Anastasia's just like, well, maybe you're lucky. And at this point I was like, oh, so her character is going to be sort of this individual that doesn't put up with his overly controlling, arrogant bullshit. And I was like, oh, this could be interesting, but wrong that does not happen at all <laughs> look there are good movies set in the world of you know dominance and submission and whatnot this just isn't one of them <laughs> like they you know you reference secretary in the introduction secretary is a great movie and it has all, all you know it's got its kinky side for sure but it's very much about the relationship between these characters whereas this just feels like a stroke material <laughs> which is what it is it's just like oh look he's all sexy and look how sexy she is and what if they were sexy together she asks a bunch of questions that nobody cares the answers to but then her fourth question that just falls out of her mouth is she's like are you gay it's like she didn't know this question was coming which either one she's lying or two she truly did not prepare for this interview at all and she's just reading all the words off the paper in front of her let me give you option c which is what i had in my notes <laughs> which is is she mentally handicapped? Is it like a Ron Burgundy thing where no matter what's on the teleprompter, he just reads it? Like, she just can't <laughs> not read what's on the paper before her. There's no filter between the eyes and mouth. I think that you have inspired me to maybe watch this movie again. Filtering it through the idea that she is mentally handicapped in some capacity, the way that Charlize Theron's character was on Arrested Development, gives a whole new dimension to what's going on in this film that may arguably be better. This is just the other sister with nipple clamps. <laughs> I stand by that. <laughs> If her asking him if he's gay is the fourth question, shouldn't that really have been the first question? Just start with a bang. Or better yet, if that's the fourth question, what was question number five? Like, how big is your dick? <laughs> By question six, it's just like, do you bleach your asshole? <laughs> And then following this, we get this ribald tete-a-tete -tete with Anastasia talking about being curious. And there's some knowing glances about what, who knows, who cares. I mean, arguably, he's just a sexual predator. And we find out later that he's been like all whipped and fucked when he was a kid. So he was raised this way or something. I, I'm, I'm not sure sort of how to reconcile all of that. I, well, in the, the movie raises the question. He actually says at one point in this film, well, I can't tell you about what happened to me. And then the movie fucking ends before he does. It, oh, it's a trilogy. You got to come back for part two and three. We'll get into that later, but you can just go right ahead and fuck yourself on that one. <laughs> Christian tells Anastasia, hey, why don't you ask me something that you want to know? And Anastasia's like, you've said that some people know you well. Why don't I think that that's not true? Well, that's not a good question, you know? I mean, that's more about you than me. This life-size Barbie doll comes in and she's like, Mr. Gray, um, you asked me to come in and throw out this street urchin in 10 minutes and I'm here with security as you uh, instructed. And Christian's just like, he's like, oh, oh, oh. He's like you get out of here. This is my friend. I'm making business. Get out of here. Get out of here. And at this point, Christian asks Anastasia, hey, so uh, is it Charlotte? Charlotte Bronte or Jane Austen or Thomas Hardy that made you fall in love with literature. And she's like, it was Nicholas Sparks. Have you read the notebook? He's my favorite. 
And let's be honest, even if it were one of those three, which of course it turns out to be Thomas Hardy, because that's the most melodramatic of the three. It's like, those are your inspirations? The the most pop culture? Ah, fine, fuck it. I mean, why get upset over this little detail, I suppose? But I, just when they listed those names, I, I like I jotted down those authors in my notes of like, Thomas Hardy, Charlotte Bronte, or Jane Austen, they're all kind of the same author, just Thomas Hardy's a little more depressing. <laughs> What about Shakespeare? What about Blake? Ah, <laughs> fuck you. So as Anastasia leaves, uh, Christian Five Finger discounts this page of questions that her... Yoink! He does. He gives it a good old-fashioned <laughs> yoink. I loved it. She leaves, and she's a real dum-dum, so she doesn't notice. And these two say goodbye in the elevator, which it's a bit of a framing device that they repeat in this film. And as the doors close, uh, she says, Christian, and he says, Anastasia. And jumping to the end, that's how the movie ends, because it's just the worst. Because <laughs> it's... Yeah, because this movie is terrible. It's got the... <laughs> The the stru- you know the classical structure of your RoboCops. <laughs> <laughs> then she goes outside to get rained on because she's a sensualist. Chad, she's. I just want to experience life. I just want to let my hair down. I just. I don't know what I want to do. That was so intense. I've got a liberal arts degree, almost, and that guy was really something. He is and intense. I cannot get to a latte fast enough. Um, so at, <laughs> she goes back to uh, her apartment with Kate, and Kate has gotten an email with all the answers to the questions on, on the on the page. Yeah, Kate's and not sick like, anymore. All that explosive <laughs> diarrhea dried up or whatever was right, wrong with like, her. What? Yeah, thanks for doing my job for me. Now let me reap the <laughs> reward, sucker. <laughs> huh, do you need me to go get some cleaning supplies and maybe do the bathroom? We didn't mention this earlier. She didn't just drive downtown to go do this. This is in Seattle. And there's a, a moment where they show a, a highway sign of how many miles away. And it's like Seattle's like 90 miles away. I mean, so she drove an hour and a half to the big city and then an hour and a half back to what? Collegeville, USA or wherever the hell they are. Like this yeah. was a trek. You're 100% right. And <laughs> it's just, I feel, I feel better now. Thank Thanks for doing that for me, dummy. I mean, Anna. Anastasia goes into the kitchen and she starts making a sandwich. And then these two start dishing about how cute Christian Grey is. Like he's the new bartender down at Finnegan O'Gill's Irish Pub. This guy is a billionaire. And these two Uh are yakking it up like either one of them have a chance with this guy. Which, look, we know that later on one of them is going to get whip fucked, you know, in this sex dungeon. But they don't know that now. They have no chance of hooking up with this guy. Also, Anna, as it turns out, spoilers, is a virgin at this point, and like her launch pad into sexuality <laughs> is going to be a Playboy billionaire. I mean, do you want that to be your first time? I don't want that to be my eighth time. It's a fucking lot of pressure. That guy has had exotic sex, you know, from all over the world. I've never had sex in in her shoes. <laughs> We cut to Anastasia and she's sitting in college class and she's not paying attention and she's gnawing on that souvenir pencil she got from the gray building. It's almost like it's this penis (laughs) that I'm just pressing against my lips ever ever so softly. And when I saw this scene, my note here literally is Jesus Christ movie. Like, I get it. Like, like you said, subtlety is, is not the strong suit of this film. No. But she might as well have just had a dildo (laughs) poking her cheek out as she went down on it in class. Oh, Christian. Huh? (laughs) Class? Sorry. Thomas Hardy. You'll be writing your thesis paper on Moby Dick. Oh, oh, what what did you say? Oh, I was just thinking of it. I was just thinking of Christian might have a Moby Dick. That's symbolism. We cut to the parking lot and Anastasia's friend, Jose, he runs up and uh, he's going to have this photography showing at an art gallery, which my first thought was, oh, this is her gay friend. And it kind of turns out he's not gay. And the problem is that I look, I don't know who's gay and who's isn't. I, I'm to the point now where I just assume everybody's gay. I assume I'm gay and I'm not gay. <laughs> At least I don't think I am. I'll ask my boyfriend. He might know for sure, but my wife's going to be very upset depending which way that goes. I'll tell you, Kirk's nice. I, I think he, he won't lie to you. It's a win-win situation. for me. I've always liked him. 
<laughs> Anastasia. She can't stick around and chit chat with maybe gay Jose, her photographer boyfriend. Maybe gay Jose, one of the worst uh, of the Hispanic rappers of, of the um, early 90s. Says you, you know? Well, all right, fair enough. That's subjective. I'll, I'm willing. Anastasia is late for work at the uh, Clayton Hardware Store, which, fun fact, it used to be known as Shonash Hardware Store, and at the end of the third movie, it's actually Eastwood Hardware. Everywhere I look, I see something that reminds me of Christian. Here's a hammer. There's a drill. Here's the plow. Anastasia's in this hardware store. She's hanging up like ball peen hammers and she's restocking plungers and rat traps or whatever. And she's <laughs> talking to her mom on the phone. And then here we find out that her mom and stepdad won't be making it to her college graduation. And Anastasia, she's okay with it. And it truly seems like it's not the first time she's been disappointed. She works at a hardware store. I know. I know. It's nitpicky. I I, I, I admit but the fact that this is the story of a billionaire and a girl who works at a hardware store is just stupid. And then Christian just shows up in the store and he's like, hey, I was just uh, here on business and I need to pick up some things. I need some cable ties and some masking tape and some rope. What? The th this dude is a 27-year-old billionaire and he's buying cable ties and tape and rope. How did he not just ask for chloroform, a giant plastic tarp, a local map outlining the quickest route to the nearest location where someone cannot be heard screaming continually out loud? So how big a bag do you sell lime in, <laughs> you know, to like put on a body? How is she not calling the police? Right. You know, in a different movie, this would be the scene where she becomes the next victim. One of my, I don't know, top five dumbest things in this movie, I think. <laughs> when he's like, hey, how about some rope, huh? And she is just pulling rope off a spool. And he says, huh, you're pretty good at that. Were you a Girl Scout? <laughs> and you're like, what? Pulling rope? What? What special skill did she just... And, like, she is literally just winding it around her arm. You must be really good at putting away Christmas lights. I'm a billionaire, you know. I make telecommunications. And she's like, no, I was never a Girl Scout. You know, just doing stuff with other people just wasn't my thing. I'm kind of a loner. This whole scene has dialogue that you would find in a romantic, like, Hallmark Christmas movie. Which, let's be honest. In a straight-to-Kindle stroke book, Chad? This movie is a lifetime movie. Except you yes. swap out the playful snowball fights and the first time ice skating awkwardness with some consensual rope bondage and nipple clipping. Except those have an ending. They both open up the, the veterinary clinic or the gluten-free muffin bakery or they save town hall or whatever. Right. Somebody gets adopted or, you know, Christmas is saved. Whatever the fuck happens. Somebody becomes a queen. Um, but wisely, Anna is putting all this together. And it's like, what are you, a serial killer or something? He goes, <laughs> not today. <laughs> and it's like, that is the worst possible response to that question. Of like, yeah, you know, catch me the right time. Sure, sure, I've killed some people. If you want, I, I could be stick around here. You guys could take special photos of me for his school paper uh, pictures. And she's like, oh, that that would be uh, that would be great. And then <laughs> at this point, this other hunky uh, male worker at Shonash, ah, I mean Clayton Hardware, um, comes up to help Anastasia while she's finishing up this sale of rope and tape and other, you know, murder accoutrements. And then Christian just gives this guy the stink eye. And in another movie, this dude is going to end up with his torso in one county, his head, arms, and legs in another. Yeah, he comes home at night. His, his parakeet is chirping a little too loud. He's like, you know, Mr. Pickles, what's got you so worked up? And he goes to the birdcage that's hanging in his living room. Meanwhile, behind him, the drapes push aside. The killer is revealed. It's me, Christian Grey. I'm going to take you out because you're my competition. And then, stab, stab. Um, 
in a better movie, that's what would have happened. We come back and Anastasia's friend, maybe gay Jose, or he's doing the photo shoot of Christian Grey. And um, he's most likely gay Jose tells Christian, hey, let's let's try one with a smile. And then Christian doesn't smile because he is so mysterious i just his eyes are so smoky it's like looking at a campfire after someone peed on it and put it out roommate gate says christian can't stop staring at you anastasia and you're like staring like creepily undressing this woman with her eyes wondering if he could make a suit out of her skin is more like it Uh uh-huh christian asks anastasia if most likely gay jose the photographer is her boyfriend she's like what jose as if he's like my brother or maybe my gay friend i don't know i can't really tell and then christian's like what about that other guy at the store the one who has the parakeet named pickles is he your boyfriend she's like paul as f no whatever i mean i gave him a handy one time but that's because he got something off a shelf that was really high <laughs> that doesn't count and then christian's like, like what about that guy earlier today in traffic the one who let you pull in front of him what about him is he your boyfriend no i mean i blew him but what about that guy who sits next to you in class when you chew on that pencil with my name on it that i saw you through my binoculars in your class is he your boyfriend gary I- Oh my god, Christian. I just sit in his lap and wiggle. I don't even touch him. These two ding dongs go for coffee. And Christian <laughs> poison are Christian poison her cup of Joe. And then he unwraps her a muffin, which normally something like this may be viewed as considerate or romantic for a first date, but then Christian ruins it when he demands, eat it! You know? I'm used to getting my own way, Anastasia. I'm 27 billion year old billionaire. I get what I want. Eat that muffin. It's brand. It'll make you go poopies later. Yeah, and this is also for the record for those keeping up with the story. And and by the way, don't. Um, but this is one of one of the first scenes where Christian Gray says, "No, you want me to be all romantic, but no, I'm not romantic." And <laughs> and then she it basically he walks her out and is like, you know, hey, maybe you should just leave me alone. Then she almost gets hit by a bike because it's Canada and it's the <laughs> most polite hit and run you'll ever see where there's a bell going off. It, ring, 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 ring. Get out of the way. It's I'm coming down the sidewalk. Astasia, look out. I'll save your life. <laughs> Here comes somebody with one of those little dogs in a basket. When he saves her life, things ring, get ring. all things get all intimate and he touches her face and she closes her eyes and he's like i am not the man for you you should steer clear of me which under what circumstances can she steer clear of him she is a like 22 year old english major who works in a hardware store under what circumstances do their paths cross Oh, and he d- by no means leaves her alone. I mean, just immediately he starts fucking with her. Uh, it's like he knows the dentist method from Always Sunny, where he's like, let's build her up, and this is the break in her down point. But then he sends her a gift. Yeah, a package arrives at their apartment, and roommate Kate opens it up, and she reads off this literary quote that Anastasia finishes it, because remember, she's got a 4.0 GPA, and she can recite all quotes from all literature, and it's from Tess the Durbervilles. You know, fuck her. And Anastasia opens up the package and it's got a bunch of books in it and they're all first editions from Christian and roommate Kate like looks at her and you, her face just says she has no idea what the term first edition means. No, I've got these on my Kindle. <laughs> Why do I need these? These are stupid. Kate and Anastasia, they decide to go out and celebrate, I guess, completing their finals or something about college. Right. And they're there and maybe gay Jose is there. And then Anastasia, she's a little drunk and she has to go take a piss. So she drunk dials a billionaire Christian Grey. Can you imagine any 22 year old drunk college girl calling up this guy? It'd be like calling up like Mark Zuckerberg or Dustin Diamond. Was Dustin Diamond a billionaire? How could he not be? He was in porn. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's true. And all porn stars are financially well off. The the internet has done nothing (laughs) to suck the money out of that industry. Um, In in this moment where Anna is drunk dialing Christian Grey, to your point, I could see that it could happen. It would just only happen once. Because in about, I don't know, say 37 minutes, she'll be sitting (laughs) at her stool in the club and there will be the of two silenced bullets (laughs) exploding her brains all over Kate. 
and then she no longer is a problem for Christian Grey. When she drunk dials Christian Grey, he answers the phone. He's like, Anastasia's me, Christian Grey, you mysterious billionaire. And, <laughs> Anas- and Anastasia's like, hey, I'm sending back your books because I already have them and mine are newer and yours are all crappy, so whatever. And then Christian immediately asks, like, Anastasia, where are you? And she's like, I'm standing in line to go pee. And he's like, hey, slow down, Anastasia. I want to hear all of the details. You're going to go make pee pee? Did that muffin I gave you earlier ever kick in? Look, I'm mysterious and I'm into some really weird stuff. All right. So I want to hear all about you making number onesies and number twosies. All right. Stay away from me, but also, can you take your phone in the restroom? Can I hear it? Anastasia hangs up on him, and Christian immediately calls back, and he's like, Hey, where are you? I'm, I'm going to come get you. Don't bother trying to understand how I figured out where you are. I'm in telecommunications. I'm a billionaire. I can do all this stuff. And then, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is really one of those, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> Kind of moments in the movie. <laughs> so Anastasia immediately, the timing of this next scene is really important. Anastasia takes her piss and then she immediately goes outside and then maybe gay Jose follows her outside and he gives her his jacket because it's cold and he's a gentleman who might be gay. And then most likely gay Jose leans in for a kiss and it turns out that he's maybe not gay Jose. And she's like, oh, what are you doing? Why are you trying to kiss me? We've both been drinking. This is so weird. I've never seen this before. I'm a virgin you don't know that yet at this point from out of nowhere comes christian gray from inside the bar because right for one i'm assuming that his telecommunications company makes portals to transfer human beings from one location to immediately another and then when Christian comes running out of this bar, which, how did he get in there in the first place? He busts up, most likely not gay Jose, as he's trying to kiss Anastasia. And he's like, hey, she said no. And I know that she said no because I was inside the bar when she said no. And I can see through walls and read lips. I'm a mysterious billionaire Christian Grey. Back off, you. I am 100% not the Batman. And at this point, Anastasia pukes on the sidewalk. And Christian holds her hair back in a sign of what you may think is I don't know, kind of like urban chivalry. But as he's watching her, you're just like, is this dude really into watching chicks vomit? All right. Yeah. Let's say yes. Let's just put it on top of all the others. (laughs) Inside, Kate, the roommate, is dancing with Christian Gray's brother, Elliot. That's my brother. He's inside. You didn't know there was more than one of us. Don't worry about it. He won't be in the movie much. (laughs) The more that accent gets away from me, the more I like it. (laughs) So then at that point, she's like, Oh my goodness, I'm gonna faint. And she does, and Christian Gay Gray catches her. My note here is she is a terrible character in this movie. She has no agency at all. You know, you mentioned this earlier. It's not like the character was this like strong, independent woman that is giving as good as she gets, and the the notion of the power exchange is about her being able to trust him and him being able to love her. No. Like this is all fan fiction shit about fan fiction. Yes. There is a movie called The Duke of Burgundy. Have you ever seen it? I have not. Okay. Very brief. It is a movie about a lesbian DS relationship. And it is fascinating, it is beautifully shot, it is complicated, it is absolutely incredible. It it truly is like an artistic film. And there's very little like overt sexuality, it's just a very sensual movie, uh, for lack of a better term. This is what this movie lacks, what Fifty Shades of Grey lacks, is there's no sexiness to the sexy time. In this scene, after Christian Grey snatches Anastasia Steele off her feet after she's been drunk, and there's this whole scene where she wakes up the next morning where he has left pills and water by the bed with little notes saying, take me and drink me, and she does, and then he comes in from presumably his billionaire run. Mm -hmm. then he's like well so how are you feeling and he's kind of getting undressed but it's like this scene should be tense there should be sparks between these characters in this scene did you ever see the movie stroke race good (laughs) also chad (laughs) a little uh correction because i'm nothing if not a bear for facts and in this scene when they are discussing where he slept and he says well i slept there uh, in bed right beside you and she says did we implying did you 
take advantage of me, Stroker A style, right. as you implied. Then he says, I'm not into necrophilia. Correction, Chad. Necrophilia is, of course, the fetish for, for sex with a dead person. Right. What she is referencing is somnophilia, mm -hmm. which is also known as sleeping princess syndrome mm -hmm. or sleeping beauty syndrome, in which people are sexually aroused by the idea of having sex with people who are fast asleep. Or as it's known more presently, cosmeitis. Right. Let me go to yeah. somnophilia, somnophilia. <laughs> no, with the roping and the raping. Uh, All right. So she uh, also says, or he says, you know, if you were mine, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. How, how does he say it? <laughs> uh, you were mine. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. You know, that could be interpreted quite a few ways, which the least likely interpretation is the one that he is implying. All right. I, you got to fill me in because the most likely one, when I hear that, I think he's going to spank her. And you thought, well, you know, butt stuff. Oh, going up the old pooper. <laughs> I get it now. I see. I didn't immediately go to <laughs> anal sex. I went to the spanking. That's because I'm a romantic. We still have things we don't know about each other, bro. Yeah. We can still surprise each other. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why the relationship is strong. There's still an element of surprise. Anastasia <laughs> asks him, why am I here? And he's like, because I'm incapable of leaving you all alone. Which, cuckoo. You're like, what kind of a crazy person are you? <laughs> he's like, do you remember when we were getting coffee? <laughs> I gave you a bran muffin. Did you ever kick in? I'm into weird stuff. And I was all like, I don't do romance, you know? And you were like, I bet I can make them do some romance. No, no. And uh, no, I want to remind you of that again. Nine. And say, I have one very singular tastes. One. Right. As soon as he says, my tastes are singular. Hello, this is 911. <laughs> what is your emergency? Yeah, this guy, he says he has singular taste, and then I think he put something in a muffin, and now he said he wants to put something in my muffin, and that's assault. Are you safe, ma'am? Do you need assistance? I am hung over. I could use some orange juice. Can you send an officer with some orange juice and a rape kit? Yes, I'm talking about you, mister. I'm looking at him. What is your name? Anastasia. Again, who we are later going to find out in this movie is a virgin. And when uh, Christian tells her, he's like, like, I'm into some really weird stuff. You understand? She's like, you should enlighten me. And this guy is a 27-year-old billionaire. Okay, she uh -huh. works in a hardware store. She has no prospects for her future. How dare you? Well, yeah, I mean, he's a monster in this movie. We'll get to it here in a second. It doesn't, well, it takes longer than it ought to. He is so turned on by the fact that she's a virgin. It is, it's gross. She ends up going into his office. Uh, at, this is, you know, after he fucks off for the shower and whatnot on the previous scene. And she goes in the office and uh, he's like, you know, I like to bite that lip. <laughs> and then uh, is like, hey, I'm going to send Taylor to take you home. And all, and he's going to pick you up later from the hardware store. I want to, uh, there's some paperwork I want to give you. I want you to look it over. Then th they're in the elevator together and he's like, oh, fuck the paperwork. And there's this passionate, <laughs> you know, in quotes, passionate scene where they make out pretty heavily until the elevator dings and you know the doors open and they have to have, act all straight and whatnot it's another of those moments where it's like this should be hot and it's just not because there's there's no chemistry between the actors it doesn't feel like they're getting hot you know what i mean once they get back to their apartment roommate kate is there fucking elliot the brother they're on the couch and even though they're wearing clothes in this movie part of me's like they were fucking, right? And then they come in and he's like, hey, what are you doing, Elliot? Quit fucking that strange girl. I'm here with a classy lady, Anastasia. And so they, they <laughs> bolt out and, and, and they're gone. And then he's like, yeah, he's like, hey, we're going to... We're going to send a, a car for you at the hardware store tomorrow. So be ready to go. And so 
A car picks her up and then takes her to a helicopter landing pad. And yeah. she's like, she's like, well, it is crazy. He, uh, Christian is the one who's going to be the pilot. And she's like, oh, this is crazy. You're a pilot and you're a billionaire. Oh my God. You've hit the lottery. And he, he straps her into the helicopter and he like, he like tightens up the straps. Cause you know, he's into bondage. That's, you know, pretty subtle. I don't know if you caught that one or not. And he's like, Hey, there's no escaping now. You're strapped into my helicopter. I got you all all tied up like a Christmas goose. <laughs> they fly back to Seattle and some pop songs playing in the background. Oh, every song in this movie sounds just enough like of the others to be indistinguishable. <laughs> and they're all vaguely bad. It's the music you would hear in Purgatory. Anastasia and Christian go to his giant apartment. And there's opera music playing on the sound system, which... Who listens to opera besides opera singers? Nobody. It's just pretentious. Tom Hanks <laughs> with a healthy dose of AIDS. Strike two. Oops. Christian then presents Anastasia with this non-disclosure agreement that says that she cannot talk about the two of them and their relationship with anybody else, which you know what? That is a red flag. Yeah. Well, and here's another one. Why, why can't we just make love, Christian? Well, because I don't make love. I fuck. <laughs> and I fuck hard. And there's another thing you need to know. Come over here. I want to uh, show you my playroom. And before you run screaming out of my luxurious apartment, there's a helicopter outside. I'll take you wherever you want to go. But I need to show you my sex dungeon. So come this way. So he takes her to the red room. Dude, this place looks like every lounge that you see in the corner of every bowling alley everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Except for the fact that there's a four poster bed and a bunch of whips and handcuffs and shit all over the place. The walls are this red velvet. It's got wooden floors. It's all dark. There's one door in and there's a door in the back that goes to the toilet. The whole place just says, run screaming out of this building right now. But instead, our hero of the film, theoretically, Anna, is just walks in and is like, what is this? And he's like, Oh, that's a flogger. You hit people on the behind with it. <laughs> and then she's like, what is this? And he's like, oh, that's a, a cane, you know, for whipping. And, uh, you know, and then he's like, there are whimdooslers and scrimshoglers. And who builds this kind of a sex room for billionaire playboy weirdos? Is that like a some kind of niche architectural area of expertise do you have to like seek out the best in the business to get this just right to kind of make your sex dungeon come to life well you know there are people who do everything chad do you think there was a guy who was like who's like ah hey like uh hey hey uh, mr gray oh uh, this is gonna be real nice the walls of velour with a microfiber true coat you know what you take a a wet sponge and and it'll wipe off any foreign substance you can think of in a gif. We're talking about saliva, blood, semen, water solvent, and petroleum-based lubricants, feces, let's be honest, tears. Anything you can imagine hitting this fabric. Boom, wet sponge, it's gone. I came across this when I was putting in Jim Henson's fuck dungeon. <laughs> Turns out he had a friend at NASA that could uh, pull a few strings. Jim Henson's Fuck Dungeon should be a band. Over here, they got this other little addition. On the outside, it looks like a regular piece of floorboard that's already scruffed up with fingernail scratches for authenticity. But right here, you lift it up. It's a modified laundry chute that leads to the building's incinerator, just in case. I learned that one from Fred Savage. That guy, oh, he's got some deep, dark secrets. Let's just say there are some barrels in the basement. <laughs> now, I normally don't do this for my clients, but over here, the bedpost, they're specially coated with ground-up Viagra and equestrian prenatal vitamins. If you ever need a little bit of ba-ba-ba-boom, just lick the post, bingo-bongo, there's lead in your pencil and a ringing in your ears. Thank Jimmy Carter for that little bit of inspiration. <laughs> Back to our movie. Uh, so... <laughs> Jimmy Carter. Um, just one other side note, a footnote, if you will. I happen to know through the the, the podcast network, LegionPodcast.com, there is a, an, a practicing dominatrix who does the show. I know her well enough that I reached out to her today, and I was like, hey, so what's up with Fifty Shades of Grey in, in you know, the real-life BDSM community? And 
Her response was, <laughs> a lot of dominants force their subs to read chapters from this book as punishment. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That is very funny, I thought. But yes, it is just for the record, because I happen to, to know someone in that community. On her behalf, say, the community itself seems to be very much about the relationship and not the shit that you see in this movie. Just, just a note. But yeah, so he shows her his fuck dungeon. He's like, say something! What do you think about this fuck dungeon? Are you cool with this? And she's like, so do you beat people or do you let people beat you? And then Christian's like, hey, look, I'm a dom. I whip the shit out of women who agree to let me do this to them. And I'm gonna... I'm gonna Whip the shit out of you. Yeah. Out of like, you. <laughs> Look, I got some rules, all right? <laughs> now, you follow the rules, we got no problem. But you don't follow the rules. <laughs> then you get whipped right on the bottom. <laughs> and <laughs> he's like, yo, I'm going to swing the deal here. You come stay with me Friday through Sunday. I'll give you a little room. <laughs> you can. You can sleep in that room all by yourself, and then uh, I'll just, I'll whip your <laughs> Every now and again, you and me, we go in a red room. I take that tail for a spin. And then you'll get a nice bedroom all weekend long. It's like a big sleepover, only... You don't come in my bed or I'll have you killed. She says, we're not going to sleep in the same bed together. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what are you, stupid? I keep saying, <laughs> no, no, no to the romance. <laughs> and you're like, no, Christian. I want to kiss you. I want to make out with you. I know you do. <laughs> it's here that she. he's like, like, hey, we can we can negotiate, you know, what you want to do. You know how, like, when you have sex, there's some stuff you'll do and some stuff you won't do? And she's like, um, I'm a virgin. And then he's like, oh, my God, where have you been? He's just like, oh, virgin, you say? <laughs> Hold on, don't tell any witch covens about this. They like them, too. And then he immediately is like, oh, I'm going to have to rectify this situation. Which, if when I hear rectify, I'm like, uh-oh, butt stuff. Um, <laughs> I wish I had a slide whistle for this show. <laughs> I'll get one before the end of the season. <laughs> so, so Christian takes Anastasia to one of his many bedrooms to have sex with her. In this scene, he pulls down her pants. And the backlighting of it, she has... A lot of hair on her legs, specifically her upper thigh. She clearly was not expecting this to go down on the date. Or maybe she just shaves to her knees. I don't know what her grooming habits are. Or she was just like, fuck it. I'm not, I mean, we we know that she doesn't because her we see a lot of her and her legs would be a lot hairier below the knees. It's weird. It is strange. I noticed that too. But I, like, I had that weird conflict. Where I was like, good for her. Don't shave your legs. Fuck patriarchy, you know? Rebel, rebel. Represent. I get it. On the other hand, it's like, but then why shave your armpits then? Like, why why shave anything? <laughs> so, I I just, I like, I want to be on, on the side of do, uh, whatever. Who the fuck knows? This movie confuses me, Chad, as a person. This scene is supposed to be all romantic with him undressing her. And like he kisses her thighs and he takes off her shirt. And then he takes off his shirt and he's got all these scars on him. And I guess this is going to get explained in the other movies. I will never know. And I will happily go to my grave not knowing. I just... Yeah, don't even tell us. Don't write in. <laughs> Don't and, post nothing. Don't like. Don't tell me how any of this ends. I don't care, <laughs> and I don't need it in my brain. I do like that Christian takes off his pants and he's going commando. And we do get to see a quick like glimpse of his balls, which not since our episode of the ladies' man have we seen a peak of scrotum. So that was nice. I like the fact that there was an uproar around this movie about the fact that 
Jamie Dornan wasn't going to show his dick in the movie. Which, in fairness, Dakota Johnson doesn't show her pussy, really. You see her pubic hair. There's a side show. But that was all digital. They wore modesty patches, and the hair was digitally added. So it's the opposite of what happened with uh, Superman. When they got rid of his mustache hair, they just put it over here on her. That's exactly right. I like that when he has sex with her, he rips a condom open with his teeth and puts it on his dick because there's nothing that I like thinking about more than either one unwanted pregnancy or vd in a fuck scene i wish he turned like a chair around and climbed across the back of it hey everyone before we get down to the fucking i just want to remind everybody put a jimmy on as much as this scene tries to be romantic and i'm like okay i get it then the camera pans up to the ceiling to fireworks and a train going through a tunnel like why aren't we seeing them fucking this scene again i hate to sound like a pervert but if we're doing a movie about fucking then show some fucking. And this is just every sex scene you've ever seen in every movie with a hint of ball. <laughs> I like when the camera pans up to the ceiling and you either see a mirror or a security camera down. Yeah, it's all just being filmed. You can hear the whir of the camera. <laughs> it's like Bob Crane is behind a one-way mirror. Really getting his jollies. I apologize for using a Bob Crane reference. <laughs> we well, Bob to... <laughs> Crane, babe, right behind the mirror. Cha-cha. We then get to see Christian Grey, and he's playing his grand piano in his giant apartment, which I was hoping he would be naked like Harvey Keitel in pretty much every movie he's in. Um, but specifically, you know, in the piano when he walked around rubbing his dick all over the keys. He had a no-dick clause, Jamie Dornan did. How on earth do you take this role and have a no-dick clause? You got to go in there dick swinging. You got to be your Ewan McGregor's, your Harvey Keitel's. Somebody that's like at the audition just plonk right on the table and is like, here's my dick. Now would you like to see me act? <laughs> Before I say a word, this is what's going to be on camera. How do you feel about that? Because I feel good. I'm not going to lie to you. This movie's going to be in 3D, right? Well, it should be. All right? You know what that's going to add to the bottom line? Come on. You're going widescreen, right? You understand what I'm saying? Because of the size of my penis. You should get a wider aspect ratio the next morning anastasia is making breakfast for christian like a normal couple and then they go take a bath together like a normal billionaire would do with his concubine until christian says so how about i tie you up and whip the shit out of you and she's like whoa hey slow down you know can can i ask you a quick question uh -huh. what is the central conflict of this movie at this point i do not know i have that question for you later so i'll ask it to you when it comes up and my question is what is the plot of this movie <laughs> yeah i mean essentially it's girl hooks up with billionaire then doesn't will she sign the contract or won't she who cares? Yeah, I have a point in in the notes where I uh, I actually said if the end of this movie is her decision of whether or not to sign the contract, this movie can go fuck itself because th <laughs> this set this is set up in the first what twenty minutes of the movie. The movie should be what happens after the contract is signed. No, 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 no. They don't do anything like that. That's that, but that's the shit you want to see. I don't give a shit about them going back and forth about how they feel about getting down to some good fucking. Just get down to the good fucking. I like when he when he ties up her hands here and he's like, oh, I'm going to fuck you now because you're a little bit tied up. Not sex dungeon tied up, but just a little bit. And then who shows up? His mom, a.k.a. Marsha Gay Harden, which look, man, if anybody could ruin sex, it's Marsha Gay Harden. You know what I thought in this scene? Miller's Crossing's a real good movie. <laughs> After his mom comes in, Anastasia rolls down and the mom's really happy to see that her son isn't gay because they tell us that the mother has never seen her son with a woman before. So that seems crazy. When, again, when Marsha Gay Harden showed up in this movie, I was like, man, maybe she'll just be a wacky enough character. Like, I'm just grasping at straws here. Like, give me somebody acting over the top. Give me that almost like showgirls level of camp at least from one character, so there's something to look forward to from scene to scene. But she's not. She's nothing. She is nothing like every other character in this movie. And, like, she drops a line, like, about, hey, we're having a dinner for a sister that who could give a shit about her, mm -hmm. but we're having a dinner. So how about you come, Anna? And she's like, oh, I'd love to. Is that okay, Christian? Should I be tied up at dinner? And he's like, shut the fuck up! Uh, <laughs> 
then she calls Kate and and Kate's like, "Are you okay?" And she's like, "Listen, I'm just gonna hang out and fuck for a while. I just did that for the first time. And have you tried it? It's so good." <laughs> Have you tried it? Christian comes in to, and he says to Anastasia, so are you going to sign this contract or not? And she's like, I don't know. And he says, well, let me show you your fancy bedroom. And she walks in. She's like, how many women have ever stayed in this room? And then Christian says, 15 women, which doesn't include prostitutes or street urchins or humans that were gifted to me. And slaves legally purchased in other countries where slavery is still legal or maybe just frowned upon. But, you know, let's call it 15, 18. You know what, 15. I, yeah, 15 women. And for a weekend, there was a Randy goat. But it's, uh, it's a long story and it was just 48 hours. Hey, 60 hours. She asks, so are we going to go on movies and go to dinner and dates and stuff like that? And Christian immediately says, like, no, we're not going to do that stuff. I'm going to like whip your ass and fuck you. <laughs> right. And she's like, I just, I like, I want us to like be reaching for popcorn at the same time. <laughs> and then our fingers touch in the popcorn. And it's like Lady in the Tramp, but with popcorn. And then I look at you and you look at me and then I'll know. And then I start whipping your ass and then I no, fuck you. <laughs> in the movies, Christian. You can't whip my ass in the movies. <laughs> I keep telling you that. There's a line. I don't like this story. I'm a billionaire. I run telecommunications. <laughs> He's like, uh, no, nah, I'm just going to own you. You know? Like, I get to put you in drawers or whatever. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, just take me home, Christian. Once more, we play our dangerous game. <laughs> And so he's like, all right, I go home frustrated once more. <laughs> and he drives her in one of his many cars. Or something. Are these all your cars? It's like, yeah, he's a fucking billionaire. Why are you surprised? <laughs> oh, my God. He's got a dozen cars. <laughs> of course he does. Jay, Jay Leno. Leno's got like a yeah. thousand cars. And I don't think he's a billionaire. Right. Uh, just <laughs> uh, Again, it's the other sister with nipple clamps. <laughs> are all these cars yours there has to be a billion thousand oh as he's driving her home he stops off in the woods and she's asleep and when she comes to i mean immediately i'm thinking oh i remember this place i've heard about it before this is where no one can hear you scream and it's like oh my god you're gonna die now and then christian tells anastasia like hey we need to go for a walk so they're trotting around the woods and he says hey i want to tell you something when i was 15 years old I was a submissive for like five, six years to this older lady who was a friend of my mom. She whipped the shit out of me. And that's how I learned how to do this. Of course, they name check Mrs. Robinson. So once more, I'm reminded like, boy, that graduates a good movie. I wish I was watching that. This character of, you know, the Mrs. Robinson who comes up a couple of times in the movie. But again, don't kid yourself. Any of this is going to pay off because it doesn't. Not and, in this movie. It pays right, off in the second or third one. Why are we punting everything interesting <laughs> to another movie? You got to save something for this one. Like, there's got to be a story. <laughs> I'm going to watch those other two now that I think about it. I got to see how this thing ends. No, 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 no. I know I'm not. Just at at worst, read the Wikipedia. <laughs> If you gotta know, and don't ever tell me. <laughs> Anastasia and Christian, they start making out like Frog and Bandit out in the woods because they're in love now. <laughs> and then he... <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got a real nice ass, Frog. <laughs> and then she finally gets back home and uh, Christian has ponied up a few hundred bucks, thanks a lot, Big Spender, to pay for a new computer because her other one was all busted. Also, th there's a dude there to like set it up, I guess, but it's a laptop. You take it out of the box, you plug it in, you turn it on. What's the fucking setup? You ever bought anything from Best Buy? They're like, don't you need Geek Squad to come in and handle the, you know, Wi Fi configuration? And you're like, oh. oh, so they hear like, who's this for? Oh, fuck. We can take this guy for a ride. He's got a lot of money. Hey, do you want the undercoating on that laptop? You do? I'm sure you do. It's just good <laughs> business sense, Mr. Gray. We're going to have a guy show up. He's going to uh, take it out of the box. He's going to plug it in. I know it sounds simple, but you're really going to want a professional there for that. 
<laughs> Roommate Kate is off to have sex with brother Elliot, I guess. Kate tells Anastasia that uh, more than likely not 100% gay Jose has called twice, which why bring him back up again? Just let that character go. Unless we're laying the groundwork for this like, hey, you... Get your damn hands and rope and nipple clips off her moment, which nope. never comes about. Anastasia starts doing research on bondage with her new computer. At Gray's behest, pointedly, it's like him saying, you need to start searching. Start with the word submissive and start doing some research. Yeah, and she's looking over the contract. And the thing of it is, she does an image search and she closes her laptop after looking at two, let's be honest, (laughs) pretty tame pictures of women bound up. That is a clear no to this situation. Right. The moment you see somebody tied up in in ropes and you're just like, oh, no, sir, I'm going to give that a good old fashioned Baptist no. It's not even close to a yes with a but. This is a no with an and. Yeah, there's a, not an if. That, no, this is a, a, a flat no. And then she emails him, it's been nice knowing you. Like, she's grinning when she says it, but it's like, why aren't you serious about that when you can't stand the thought? You can't stand the, the image of somebody doing what he's proposing. Yeah, so Christian just shows up at her apartment like a crazy person. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so, so I'll tie you up then? <laughs> And, and she's like, yeah, I guess. And he's like, all right, don't make a sound. Then he strips her again because that's this movie's big move. That's the big sexy <laughs> move of this movie. That's like the like the move that your brother teaches you of just like, just do this with the ladies and they'll love it. And meanwhile, it's like one girl ever liked it. Um, <laughs> he puts a blindfold on her and then he gulps down like a whole glass of wine but then he keeps some in his mouth and he spits it back into her mouth which yeah baby birds are gross (laughs) and then he rubs ice cubes all over her nipples and she seems to like it which that's great and now i'm thinking boy that hot shots was a pretty good movie (laughs) crack an egg on her belly and Uh have breakfast waiting for you it's when he drops the ice cube in her navel where i was like oh man that should be an olive (laughs) <laughs> uh, but I do like the one moment in this movie I like is when he flips her over and smacks her in the ass. It's like, now we're talking. That's what Deadshot was talking about with Rick Flagg in that last episode. You know, finally something's happening on screen and then it, you cut away. It's like this movie is the biggest fucking tease. This is the second time this woman has ever had sex with a man. <laughs> I know. She is in AP fucking. <laughs> 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 where he's like enough missionary like you get one night of missionary and the rest of your life one leg is gonna be at 11 o'clock the other is gonna be at 2 15 you're gonna be in rope bondage it's gonna be rocking christian says what are you doing to me you signed that contract i got a sex room in my apartment and i've not used it since i got back from thailand six months ago let's get this show on the right station She's like, I don't know. I'm just not sure if I want to do it. And he's like, I oh, look, I'm out of here, Anastasia. It's complicated. And then, and then he just bolts. I don't want romance. Do you remember that? <laughs> no romance for this guy. She starts messaging him because neither of them can leave the other person alone. It's just one this big codependent fuck fest. <laughs> I don't want to call it a fuck fast. It's like they've had sex twice. From her point of view, she went from zero to 60. Sir. Like, <laughs> she didn't start off in the parking lot taking a couple of laps around the utility pole. It's like Tom Hanks in Big. That day after he gets laid and he's 10 years old and he comes marching into the toy office like, hey, everybody, <laughs> sex is awesome. Well, but that kind of happens when Kate sees her and she's like, there's something different about you. Yeah, she's pregnant. Did he... <laughs> You've got a glow that says that somebody pierced your hymen. <laughs> so she, uh, she Anna, is messaging Christian that she has some questions about the contract. Like five minutes after, she was like, I don't want anything to do with you. And so he says, okay, it'll be a, a business dinner. And she insists that it's all going to be professional and on the up and up. And so when she arrives at his office, he has set the lighting in there to the dimmer setting that just says Matt Lauer. <laughs> it's it's creepy. Yeah, it looks like a fucking German expressionist <laughs> film or something. And so they start going through the 
contract and she's clarifying things and she's like okay so there's no uh, i'm saying no to any sex act on demand in this scene she says i want to talk about the soft limits part of the contract and she says i want you to strike out anal fisting soft limits anal fisting whoa what else is in this contract well right next door to anal fisting chad is good old-fashioned vaginal fisting she also puts the kai bash on that you think those are just listed alphabetically and not in order of comfort it's like fisting comma anal fisting comma vaginal (laughs) it's probably how that reads anastasia says in this rundown she's like I'm okay with vibrators and dildos. But she's like, hey, look, I'm drawing the line at genital clamps. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I think I think she's really shutting the door too quickly there, but go on. She, she asks him, what are butt plugs? Which, right, you have fucking Google, and also it is the most self-explanatory sex toy on the planet. Do you think she was equally as, as confused by the specifics of genital clamps but just the name was an immediate non-starter two fembots come in and bring them some wine and i think sushi or something anastasia goes on she's like i'm good with bondage with rope leather and cups but i'm saying no to tape because bo i don't know if you know this or not but every job you ever have will provide you with knowledge that you will use later in life And her time at Eastwood Hardware Store is paying its dividends. Sure. Knowing how much that'll hurt to pull off those arm hairs. We already saw her. We've seen her thighs, yeah. She looks like a a werewolf on the regression. So (laughs) (laughs) she's like, no, thank you. I don't wax, much less just get tape jobs as they call him in the alley christian sweetens the deal and he's like hey how about this once a week we can go to movies or ice skating or something like that but i'm still gonna whip the shit out of you though all right so sign that contract okay (laughs) i understand you're gonna whip the shit out of me christian and then (laughs) and then one thing leads to another and you're like "Uh uh-oh these two are gonna have cinemax sex on this table but then they don't and she just is like well i'm out of here in a movie bereft of chemistry this was the closest i thought to being a hot scene where he's like i want to fuck you right now and or or more appropriately (laughs) how about we get down to some fucking huh she clearly wants to because he's pointing out like you know your body's doing this like your your nose is flaring and you're pressing your thighs together and shit but he says to her your face is all flush and red and she's like no it's the lighting in this room (laughs) right because you're lighting it like you know we're going to a goth club I, I do like the that there's a little bit of give and take between these characters, at least, because I'm looking for anything, Chad, just anything in this movie to hang a hat on. And I'm like, oh, is this going to be the start of something where she's like going to challenge him? And Yeah, let me answer that. You know. It's no. But in this right. in this scene, it's the only time you will ever even get a whiff of Danny Elfman in this movie because the music of their back and forth over the contract is... It's kind of this mischievous, playful naughtiness that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it it almost feels like it should be played for humor, but it's not. It it's kind of I don't know, it's it's a weird dynamic that's going on here. But yeah, I I agree. You know, in a movie that's full of nothing, this is kind of sort of something, but it ain't much. Right. But then she just leaves. She's like, hey, this this movie's getting interesting. I better get (laughs) out of here. (laughs) <laughs> he's like you're right <laughs> we better get everyone back to sleep everyone needs the rest am i right <laughs> so he just sees her out are you gonna sign this contract or not and she's like i don't know maybe <laughs> christian when the time is right you'll know <laughs> and then <laughs> then we cut to her graduation and it's like oh right he's giving the commencement speech here her father shows up it's her stepdad because her real dad's dead and her stepdad raised her (laughs) right because it's the twilight (laughs) story and so it's the single father for the most part he for a glimmer of of a moment 
I thought that he was real drunk and was going to make a scene. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. We're going to have two good scenes in a row. And that's how you make a movie, Chad. You have a bunch of good scenes strung together by a story. That says so much about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, look, I don't. you don't have to give me the Rorschach test. I, I get it. <laughs> oh, th- oh, this guy's clearly drunk. He's right. going to embarrass her. Well, that didn't happen. I read that wrong. <laughs> so anyway so they're at the graduation and, and, and christian gray is giving his commencement speech it's a whole bunch of nothing it's just when you get out into the world you better strive and be excellent everybody have a good time and when she when she comes across the stage she- oh wait 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 before she goes to pick it up my favorite thing is with a, a couple of girls in front of her are like look how hot christian gray is and anna just shoves her head between him it's like i heard he was gay <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he definitely wouldn't fuck you skanks <laughs> maybe your brothers it is catty as shit i loved it anastasia then makes her way across the stage to get her diploma from you know whatever dean and the guy who's giving the commencement speech i've never seen that before in my life but (laughs) no the guy who gives a speech sticking around to shake hands afterwards with every person who gets a diploma no he's probably just like i'm just gonna do this until my sex slave gets here (laughs) and then after that i'm not shaking anyone's else hand all right Captain, what do you call a guy who runs a college? Smart? Accomplished? Admiral? Grand Poobah? Top Dog? <laughs> the Big Cheese? Numero Uno? Mr. Poutine? <laughs> You're the triple <laughs> double of college, right? She comes across the stage and he's like, hey, so you you say that contract, you gonna let me whip the shit out of you? And she's like, yeah, I'm gonna let you whip the shit out of me. He's like, oh, yeah, I like this so far so good the guy showed up here god fine i mean i'm at my graduation christian and ugh, th- today is about me this is my day by the way those two girls over there they said they think you're gay <laughs> they said that you're probably gay and you can't get it up and you should probably fuck me <laughs> i like all of that i wish she was saying to him like it would be a much more interesting <laughs> character if she had any investment in what's happening to her if she had turned the tables on him of like this dude's crazy i got nothing to lose i'm gonna bring him down that would have been a good movie or just like you know what he's crazy and i'm gonna out crazy him fucking look christian you get that fucking whip and i want you to maple (laughs) thorpe it i want that thing to go right up the back door mister and what i said about genital clamps you put a big plus 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 by that. I want my pussy lips just squeeze shut. And you give my nibbles what fur. <laughs> what if she just negotiated the contract the other way around? Right. <laughs> She's just like like dildos, vibrators, like roaming candles. I want one in my puss and in my asshole. And I want to fire out. I'm going to fucking burn down this building. Put that in your contract. Like, Listen, geez. you <laughs> look. I googled bl- butt plugs, and I am into it. I want. <laughs> I think they come in gauges, and I want the extra large, whatever that is. I want. I want the, the garage door opener. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It sounds painful, though. (laughs) Yeah. All right. All right. Real quick. In the spirit (laughs) of this scene, Chad, I have before me a list of the most popular sexual fetishes in a lightning round setting. You tell me yes or no. Would you be willing to entertain it or not at all? What are your hard limits and what are your, I don't know, maybe. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to start with the most popular, the ones that most people are like, yeah, all right, fine. Okay. First one, female use of sex toys. Yes. Okay. Uniforms, AKA sexy maids, firefighters, etc. Yes. All right. Spanking and light bondage. Yes. Anal sex. Am I giving or receiving? Eh, it don't matter. Just the, the general idea. Yeah, sure. Why not? Male and female domination, like being in a relationship or at least an exchange, a scene, if you will. 
of of somebody taking that role under the right circumstances yes sure okay strangely here this is weird for for me uh so group sex is next on the list uh under the right circumstances sure why not okay but group sex is way more popular than a female dominant relationship which is weird that guys would rather fuck another guy and a girl than just let the girl be in charge hmm i know i was thinking the group sex was just having sex while other people are having sex around uh eh, that's all right so all right now we get into the dodgier stuff this is the stuff that statistically speaking people are like eh, maybe not okay. okay so uh exhibitionism showing off your junk i would say more no than yes Okay, voyeurism. Watching other people? Yeah, watching, watching people get it on. Sure, why not? That's just, yeah, why, okay. All right, latex. The wearing of, one presumes? Under the right circumstances, sure. Okay, masochism. No. All right, choking. No. Pegging. Uh-uh. Race play. Absolutely not. <laughs> Urine. Uh-uh. Pet play, which I find it strange that pet play is less popular than race play. Is pet play like peanut butter in your dog? No, pet play is like <laughs> it, it, pet play is like you're with a girl and she puts uh, a tail in her ass and acts like a cat. I would never ask for it, but I would I wouldn't say no. Fair enough. I, that's kind of where I yeah. All right, I'm with you there. Piercing and cutting? No. Scat? Absolutely not. Not on purpose anyway. <laughs> Bestiality. No. And finally, the real crowd pleaser, Chad, necrophilia. No. All right. You're about in the median range. Okay. That's so, all that that makes me feel good. Yeah. After the uh the ceremony and and Anna has agreed to be a sex slave now, fingers crossed, Boozy Dad is introduced to Christian Grey and he's like, "Oh, I'm uh, I'm Anna's boyfriend." And uh, you know, <laughs> Anna's all like, "Oh, well, I guess I guess being a sex slave has its perks. Then somebody asks for a picture, and Christian pulls her into the picture to pose with Anna. Yeah, this is my girlfriend. I'm going to whip the shit out of here and have sex with her later. Say cheese. I got a public image to keep up, so like I'm not going to be beating her ass later or nothing. This is my girlfriend that I don't like tie up and smack her boobies around. And He tells her, he's like, hey, listen, you listen to me, Anastasia. You gave a verbal agreement, all right? So that counts. And here's the thing. You roll your eyes at me one more time. I'm going to bend you over my knee. I'm going to give you a real spanking. And then he takes her outside. He's like, but first, I got something to show you. And and she's like, oh, my God. The presents don't stop. This is so, so wonderful, Christian. And then he takes her downstairs and it's a new car for her. And, and because she is just apparently mentally challenged, when <laughs> she sees a brand new car on her graduation day, her first question is... That doesn't even look like the kind of car that you would drive. That looks like the kind of a car a young woman would drive. Why did you buy that for yourself <laughs> on my graduation day? Yeah. He's like, oh, I know where you would think that. Why is there a big bow on top of it? Did you drive it here like that? That's weird that you gave yourself that car. Oh my God, Christian. There are some people (laughs) over there and they've got sparklers that spell out the name Anna. How weird is that? There's someone here named Anna like me. Do you think this is her car? No, no. Here's the keys. I got it for you. We got to find this girl Anna and give her these keys. She probably needs a way home. Oh my God, how many Annas do you know? (laughs) And so, after she figures out the scars for her, something happens and she rolls her eyes and Christian's like, hey, I told you about rolling your eyes at me. So I'm going to take you back upstairs (laughs) to your apartment and I'm going to give you a real spanking. (laughs) Yeah, so he he takes her upstairs and he puts her over his knee and, you know, like pulls her pants. Because again, that's the big sexy move of this movie. The, hey... You want to you want to get the audience hot? <laughs> Says the movie. <laughs> you want to get them hot? Here's what you do: you get a real tight shot on somebody's keister, <laughs> and you just slowly drag them panties down. I mean, there will not be a dry seat in the house. <laughs> so, so that's what he does: is he pulls out her panties. And- 
<laughs> smacks her ass and and she gets into it, you know, because look, it is one of as we've just pointed out, one of the most common fantasies ever in the world. Would it be more or less of a turn on for him if she wasn't a very good wiper? Oh, who's got a stinky bottom? If he dropped her drawers and there was just like a shit streak in her underwear. You know, I'm kind of not in the mood. How about maybe you just get a shower? I'm going to get your clothes laundered. (laughs) We're just going to call this one the mulligan and then regroup after everybody's had a chance to wash. (laughs) To wash up. (laughs) What? Oh, Christian, don't stop now. <laughs> no, no. I I insist. I need to go wash my hands. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I really do. But, you know, I'm the dominant. So you go clean. <laughs> you go clean that bottom, young lady. <laughs> I'm dominating you right now to clean up that <laughs> real that real mess. We compost and we don't use toilet paper in our house. I don't know if you know that or not. So I mean, I just let it go. I mean, you've seen my thighs. I just like to be natural on that means no deodorant, no perfume soap. No, no, I know. <laughs> this is not a surprise. <laughs> But this was a surprise, you know, I mean, that was all hidden by the underwear and it was something. So she gets into it and he's like, welcome to my world. And then he's immediately like, so, uh, boy, I need to get out of here. I should probably, you know, I don't know. I may go get some Carl's Jr. or something. Uh, Is there a Tim Hortons around here? Probably. Anna's mom calls like right after he leaves and Anna's crying because she's just like, I just got fucked. Mom! I just got spanked. Right. She, yeah. Like I just got spanked by a guy and then he, then he took off. And, uh, <laughs> and what well, she doesn't really tell her that she's just like, I'm upset. Her mom is like, look, if you need a place to crash, you, you can always come stay here. And in my notes here, I say, I don't understand the conflict here still. I don't understand what the point of any of this is. And, uh, and that's before I knew the, the bitter truth that there is no point, but, uh, would this movie have played out the same way if Christian had been into like infantilism like if his sex dungeon was just an oversized baby nursery it, and he wanted her to change poopy diapers and call him a like a bad baby boy for pissing himself <laughs> i would have enjoyed the movie much more uh there is an incredible movie from the 70s called the baby that is about that very thing <laughs> it's fucking crazy and i can't recommend it enough if you're into a movie about an adult who doesn't know how to talk and wears a diaper and spends his life in a crib. Uh, it's amazing. It's real, like, exploitation trash, and I love it. That's an example of a movie that is like, you know what? This movie is about a weird kink, and it's gonna be about it. And this is a movie that is just such a cock tease of a film. It's just like, look at this sex dungeon. Think of all the sexy things that could happen here. And then nothing ever does. He, like, he, what, cuffs her up a couple of times... And that's kind of it. Like, nothing really bizarre happens in this room of Willy Wonka leather wonders. After she talks to her mom, Anastasia goes to visit Christian at his apartment. And he's like, hey, I want to take you to the playroom. And she's like, but I haven't signed a contract. He's like, yeah, I know, but let's just see what happens. (laughs) So he takes her into this fuck dungeon. And uh, Christian goes, you know, full on Dom. He grabs this riding crop. And he just starts whipping the shit out of her. And all I could think was... How would this movie have played out if they had cast a black actress in the role of Anastasia? I submit it would not have gone well. Right, because she would, I'm sure, express an opinion or point of view. As opposed to Anna in this film that's just like, Oh, it's so exotic. (laughs) There's a montage. This is the fucking Rocky IV of fuck movies. Where there's a montage every... 10 minutes so there's a a spanking slash fucking montage after which he just carries her back to her room and kisses her goodnight and do you find all of this 
nonsense, just exhausting. Because I'm watching it and I'm like, all of this bondage work seems like it's really a whole lot of effort. I mean, just the upkeep, the maintenance, cleaning, learning how to tie all of these appropriate knots. I'm just too lazy to be involved in anything like this. I again, I am no expert on the subject by any stretch. I can't, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to speak for uh, for an entire community of which I know very little. But my understanding is that in stuff like that, particularly, you know, when people are tying each other with ropes and getting really ornate with shit like that, that it, the ritual is part of it, right? Like the the doing of the thing is the sexual act, less less so than the fucking. I like when he takes off her panties and then he gives them a good sniff. Remember when the ladies man did that? Oh. He gave him a good sniff to see whether or not uh, she had VD. He was like, nah, she good. Uh-huh. Uh, Anna and uh, Christian are getting all dolled up to go to dinner at his folks place. Cause remember that. And we need a scene where nothing happens again. Before they leave, the two of them dance around his big ballroom while Frank Sinatra sings. And then Anastasia does this funky little dance where she's doing finger pointing and there's this jig. And it's just this moment where she's like, I'm in love. I'm in love. And you're just like, what is going on in this movie? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing is going on in this movie, Chad. Because all right, the next thing we go to dinner, it's all fancy. It's at the gray estate, one presumes. And Anna lets it drop as, as the conversation is all about. Hmm, so where are you from, Anna? You know, uh, oh, <laughs> your mother's from Georgia. Where on earth is that? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> still an Eddie Azar joke, uh, shamelessly. <laughs> so. Then she's like, yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm going to go visit my mother in fucking Georgia tomorrow. You're in Washington State, presumably. She's taking a plane. I, I know, but it's just like, and that's a point where Christian is like, I didn't know nothing about that. He's also fingering her under the table or trying to. And she's like, I'm going to Georgia tomorrow. He's like, hey, I'm going to stop fingering you now. I don't like the sound of this Georgia nonsense. Was this a game time decision then? Was it her deciding as he's trying to finger her, hey, I'm going to go stay with my mother? No, she's just absent-minded. She had that ticket for a week. <laughs> I, oh, my God. I totally forgot that I was going to take a steel bird. I mean, airplane. And <laughs> so... He's like, oh, I'm kind of mad right now. How about you come outside with me and we're going to take a walk like we did in the woods. She's like, how come I can't sleep in your bed? And how come I can't touch you the way you touch me? I want more, Christian. Just sign the contract. I'm mysterious. I had a rough childhood. Sign that contract and stop making me fall in love with you, Anastasia. Yeah, he says, you know, his scars are from, quote, it was a rough start in life. <laughs> it was just like, oh, God, this movie is the worst. <laughs> so later, Christian goes to Anna, who's in bed, asleep, presumably, and tells her this story about, like, once upon a time, Christian Gray had a crack addict mother. Which is, again, one of those things like, she works in a hardware store, he's a billionaire something or other, <laughs> And the mother was a crackhead. She was addicted to crack. And she was a prostitute. She died when I was four. And she did all kinds of bad stuff. There's more. But I'm not going to tell you about it now. Not in this movie in the white. No, no, no. This whole scene is the antithesis of Steve Martin proposing to Bernadette Peters and the jerk. <laughs> Yeah, where that's actually kind of charming and endearing despite the silliness. And On the first day, it was like three days. And then the second day, it was like two days. And then the next day, you went to visit your mom for half a day. So that felt like just a regular half day. But then you came back later, and it felt like two days. Anyway, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you if, if you'll marry me. <laughs> if you're going to say yes, just lie there silently. You've made me the happiest man in the world. Anastasia goes to Georgia to see her mom. Her mom appears to have a healthy, happy relationship with her husband, Jeff. Or maybe it's a Dave. Or is it David? Hold on. First, there was there was Brian. Then there was Dave. And then Jeff. 
This is David. This is number four. This is David. Yeah, and finally an hour and 40 minutes into the movie, they give me a character that I give a shit about. Her mother, the alcoholic. <laughs> Something I can hang my hat on. I can identify with this character. Yeah. She's in a good marriage. She's a drunk. Hey, they're just like us. My favorite thing in this whole movie is her say it like when she's eating the garnish out of her drink at lunch. When she says, oh, I'm just having the fruit salad. <laughs> it's fucking classy, Chad. <laughs> so unashamedly unironically a great line in the movie it was accidental i was improv yeah probably so but yeah so anna meets her mom at home and I, again it's one of those things of like why did the movie just go to georgia for a second it because it doesn't mean nothing the anyway. same reason that Shaq went to st louis that's what you do in a movie when you need to break up the action but it's two hours and five minutes long did we need to go to georgia <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I don't like the movie. It's just like, everybody pull it over. Let's just stop for a second. Too much has been happening. Anastasia and Christian, they start texting each other. And it turns out that uh, Christian is having dinner with a friend. It's that woman who used to whip the shit out of him when he was a kid. And she's like, is it Mrs. Robinson? And he's like, don't worry about it. Don't you worry about that. All right. And sign that contract. And then he tries to call her and she doesn't see the phone buzzing. Cause she, what? Ever. She has a flip phone, and, and I understand that she's supposed to be like this poor, starving college student or whatever. She did not have a goddamn flip phone. All right. Like, she scraped together enough money for one of them $19 a month Nokias. I promise you. <laughs> the best part of this whole sequence is that the very next day, Christian shows up in Georgia at this fancy hotel where Anastasia and her mother are day drinking. And as you noted, the mom is having some fruit salad. <laughs> and then That's the best. Christian orders a gin and tonic, like a straight up asshole. If you ever see this movie, don't, but he, it's the worst order ever. And then there is this moment where you're watching this and you're thinking, this is something out of sleeping with the enemy or single white female or fatal attraction. It is the thing of nightmares when his character shows up 4,000 miles away from where he was yesterday to just be like, Hey, you know, fancy me you here in Georgia, the girl who needs a side contract so I can whip her ass. I was just going by the state, you know, and, I was like, hey, I'm right next to Georgia. Why not? And then he, he immediately starts in with the, uh, I notice you're drinking. And she's like, yeah, I broke one of your rules, Christian. So what? What are you going to do about that, Mr. Man? I'll tell you, hey, here's what I'm going to do about that. All right. I'm going to teach you a lesson because I'm going to put you in a glider and we're going to go fly around over the state of Georgia for about four or five minutes of this movie for no good goddamn reason. All right. Right, and, and that's exactly what happens. It's like watching someone's vacation videos, only with worse music. Rain drops keep falling on my head. Oh, it's just the worst. Oh, but boy, it'll just make you pine for the days when we were just spinning our wheels in a glider. Because once they land, Chad, we get into a whole discussion about like, she says, Kristen, why do you fight our love? What are you afraid of? And you're just like, oh, good God. Can we get the pilot to come back around for a... A crash landing. Kamikaze right into the movie set. We are doing us all a favor. But then Christian gets a phone call. And because he has a company that, let's be honest, he should be running. And he's like, hey, what? All right, I gotta get back. I gotta go do some work with telecommunications. Anastasia returns to Seattle. This is the moment in my notes that I wrote down. What is the plot of this movie? Yeah, it, it's literally a sentence. Girl meets a guy who wants to beat her ass, and then she doesn't do it. <laughs> Anastasia shows up at Christian's apartment back in Seattle, and he's on the phone yelling about something. He's like, what? This is unacceptable. You tell them 24 hours for communications telecom, and I'm a billionaire. Business. You Buy, sell. You know, uh, orange futures, pork bellies. You get me Billy Ray Valentine on the phone. I'm Christian Gray. You better synergize our platforms who has more business acumen christian gray or lord business from the lego movie <laughs> i mean <laughs> probably lord business it, it's lord business yeah <laughs> like all of this is just not it, it's such utter nonsense it's not right about anything it doesn't say anything about relationships 
it doesn't say anything about like a subculture of BDSM, which would be interesting. It's fucking nothing. It's a fart in the wind, this whole movie. Because Christian's business is in trouble, he needs a stress reliever. Right. And he asks Anastasia to go into the sex dungeon. So cut to Anastasia and she's all tied up and naked. And we hear this angelic choir music playing and then he blindfolds her and he rubs her body with a peacock feather well but before he even starts in with any of this shit he's like oh you remember your safe words things are about to get real intense and she's like yeah i remember it's red to stop and yellow if we're getting close to something and i promise this matters it's like a traffic light oh my god i just figured that out i'm so smart and then he's just like he blindfolds her he tickles with a feather he gets a little flogger and he hits that but it's all slow-mo and arty and it's not like when he's done that she's got like these big red whelps on her body where he's causing her actual pain it just looks like it's kind of sexy fun. Yeah. Except that at the end of it, she's just like, take me back to the room. I can't believe you did that. And you're like, the fuck you talking about? Nothing happened. But she's talking to him and she's like, hey, like, why do you always want to whip the shit out of me? Is that how you show me you love me? Like, what's going on? And Christian and she go back and forth and he's like, look, Anastasia, I'm 50 shades of fucked up, Okay. I got my reasons. I'm 27-year-old billionaire with a B, okay? I make a lot of money, all right? So I'm, I'm fucked up. I was really frustrated by him saying oh, I'm 50 shades of fucked up because it's like, oh, that's almost enough to applaud for the movie title being said in the film. But just like everything else in this movie, it's one giant cock tease. So it's like just just enough to get me excited and not nearly enough to finish me off. <laughs> at this point anastasia responds to christian he's like really you know what i want you to show me your worst i want you to just take me back in the sex dungeon and i just want you to whip the shit out of me because if you need to whip me just show me what you got big boy well she says it's the only way i'll ever understand because you've explained it over and over and over and i try to listen christian i do but after a while, it's just blah, 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 and whips and chains and blah. And ugh. So you're just going to have to beat me the way you would if, say, I burned your dog a lot. And so he takes her to the red room and then strips her again because, hey, everybody, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you won't get everybody excited. Just slowly take the clothes off. And that's what happens again for like the fourth fucking time in this movie. So he strips her again. He tells her to bend over, and he's like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna whip you six times, and you're gonna count." So he's he does he beats the fuck out of her in this scene. He just no. He, see, I disagree. He just smacks her across the ass six times. But by the third time, she's crying. Because by by the time she says three, she's like, this her three. Hey, I said I'm going to smack your ass six times. You sh you be quiet. Or up to three. Whack! There's number four. Four. <laughs> I can't believe she shot me that way. That's where I got with it. I can't believe the bitch shot me. <laughs> Say it with me. You're going to live. <laughs> I'm going to be all right. He lands all six of them, and then he drops the belt he was whipping her with. And like, oh, man, I really whipped the shit out of her. That was crazy. Boy, <laughs> I really let that one go, huh? I was really worked up, but you heard me on the phone earlier. I got some business of transactions for technologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anastasia's just like, she's like, you get away from me. Even though I told you to do this, okay, it gives you pleasure to hurt me. Get away from me, you weirdo. Which, look, that's what pushed you over the line. Right. That's what made you realize this guy's a bit of a cuckoo brain. The, right. The, of all the fucking toys and plugs and dildos. Like, when, when she's like, so dildos, yes. Vibrators, yes. It's like, so in my mind, because I'm a pervert, Chad. I'm like, okay, so he's going to be jamming one in her mouth and one in her mouth. And, like, I'm thinking of all kinds of crazy shit that could go down in this movie. And instead, it's just like, smack. <laughs> well, what do you think of that? 
<laughs> it's terrible. And you're like, this doesn't seem like taboo or transgressive. <laughs> this is just a couple of people jerking each other off. <laughs> when she leaves him, Christian's standing there. He's like, like, well, I, all right, Sea Dog, that makes number 16. Back to the college campus to find another liberal arts major. Let's go do it. All right, call your driver. Let's get out of here. So she goes back to the bedroom and Gray sees himself in, of course, and she's crying because she's all upset about having been beaten the shit out of. He's like, don't, don't you hate me, but I love you. Oh, yeah. I oh. fell in love with you, Christian. Yeah, it's just like, why? Don't you fall in love with me? I'm a bad boy millionaire who's got a shit ton of money and I had sex. You're the only person I've ever had sex with. How dare you fall in love with me? I was thinking of getting a motorcycle to kind of cool down my sexiness. You know, like a big hog. I drive around with no helmet on and have leather vests. You know, just try to look a little less cool. Maybe start smoking. Anastasia says, just leave my room. And then he does. And then the next morning, she comes downstairs. And she's like, here's your laptop back. I don't even want your stupid computer. And I'd like my shitty car back. And he's like, uh, we already sold your car, but we'll give you the cash for it. I think it was like $114. She's like, that's fine. And then Christian <laughs> follows her to the elevator. She's leaving. And she's like, stop it. No. She does. It's a total like, you know, he was a dog that stuck his nose in the cookie jar. No. And as the elevator door closes, Christian says, Ella? And then she says, Christian. In movie. Thank God and also the fuck? That's the end of it? I know. I knew nothing about this movie. I like. I didn't know going into this that her name was Anastasia Steele. That was a surprise <laughs> to me when I started watching this movie, and I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" But it let me know what I was in for. Like, not <laughs> since, not since Frank Inferter has a name so told me what <laughs> what the ensuing film was gonna be. <laughs> like, if his name had been like Dirk Bicep, and Anastasia Steele sounds about right to me. But man, this movie is shocking in its attempts to do nothing for two hours yeah it is not very good it's which is amazing because i mean it made so much money it did so well and i just wonder if that was more out of erotic curiosity i also watching this movie i thought this must have been uncomfortable watching in the theater just because it's so bad you know, I know in the in the uh, introduction you talked about people going to this movie in like groups, like ladies going together, and like, hey, we're gonna have a couple of drinks and go see this movie. And I don't know, maybe there's something to that. I'm just trying to think of a scenario where someone might enjoy this movie. You know, it just seems head scratching to me because nothing happens. It is not only does nothing happen, it sets up things that should happen in this movie, and just is like, no, no. That's the next one. I'm going to whip the shit out of somebody else in the next movie. I'm probably going to go to the Mrs. Robinson lady. Maybe she's going to punch me in the face a time or two. Or you know how sexy we got in this movie. It's going to be like a million times sexier in 50. What's the next one even called? It's I know 50 Shades Free is the 50 last. Shades Darker. Oh, fuck you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Not you, Chad. Sure. I mean all of this i want i want nothing to do with any of this that is my my final takeaway from 50 shades of gray is no thank you <laughs> you can keep all of it i went into this movie i'd never seen it i've never read the books but i went into this movie expecting it to be much more focused on the sexuality part of it not that i wanted to see big screen pornography but i thought that they would do more of an elevated version of what you saw in secretary or nine and a half weeks or, you know, something like that. But yeah, it's just, it's just not very good. It really, it really, really fell flat. I was thinking all through the movie about other sexy movies that are much better than this. You know, I mentioned the Duke of Burgundy, which I, it's truly a fantastic film. If you've never seen it and you're listening to this, please watch Duke of Burgundy. If you're uh, not, not uh, afraid of somewhat taboo subjects, something like body heat, even, you know, a movie that isn't even about fucking, but it's kind of totally about fucking. But Body Heat is a million times sexier movie. 
because there's genuine chemistry between William Hurt and Kathleen Turner and their relationship and even the sex scenes, which are probably less explicit than the ones in this, even though I don't think this is a terribly explicit film. At the end of the day, a lot of boob shots, but that's kind of it. I expected this movie to take like a BDSM approach to presenting a movie that sort of made me feel uncomfortable the way David O. Russell's Spanking the Monkey <laughs> dealt with incest, you know, where you're watching it and it's kind of leaning into the less than mainstream erotic nature of a particular aspect of sexuality, which arguably BDSM is way more mainstream than incest. But to where when you were watching it, you really felt a connection to the characters and what was going on. And it just didn't. It was just like, oh my God. Now you, you sign that contract, I'm going to smack your bottom. And that was about it. <laughs> That's truly the whole film. Hey, did you sign that contract? I'm thinking about it. What about now? That's it. That's the whole movie. Not yet. That's Fifty Shades of Grey. So, Bo, you want to tease us into the next, uh, the next episode? <laughs> Funny you say that, Chad. Bo is, in fact, what we'll be talking about. Bo Derek, that is. <laughs> next time out, we're talking about... The Blake Edwards classic, um, <laughs> 10, starring Dudley Moore, uh, Julie Andrews, and Bo Derek. Th- these are actual honest-to-goodness, <laughs> talented people. <laughs> <laughs> Making a movie that is uh, has aged like a fine wine if said wine were uncorked in a sewer. <laughs> so come back. We will present more sexy comings and goings of uh, all different types of body shapes and sizes. <laughs> Little Englishmen. Giant blonde-headed women. So come back and see us again next week. If you've never seen it, as always, we'll break it down for you. We'll tell you what all the good stuff was. Uh, as always, like, rate, review, tell a friend, uh, send us a line, let us know uh, what you think, what's going on. If you have a recommendation for a season, we're always uh, open to that as well. As, uh, as we continue this season of You can do it. The sexiest season of Pick 6 movies so far. So far. So far. (laughs) That that just teases the future when the next time we do a season like this, we'll have to start with the next Fifty Shades of Grey movie. That's never going to happen. Yeah, so let's never do it again. Definitely not. All right. Until next time. Thanks, everybody.